Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. So you typed. Where did it all go then? Maybe the silverware, grow or wings ah. With a wicked sneer, asked the restaurant manager Atlas. The alleged thief stood before him green eyes, sparkling with indignation. Plump lips, trembling on high cheekbones, blazing crimson blush. But not fear, fear of a desperate longing to whitewash herself before her superiors. In short, Adriana was gone. Michael was not accustomed to having the staff of his establishment in front of him exactly that awe. I didn't take anything. When I got to the ballroom, they weren't on the table. The small banquet hall, which that day was supposed to host expensive guests, a few wives of businessmen who wished to have an elegant lunch of gossip and delicacies, was almost ready. Fresh exotic flowers in fancy broken vases elaborate menus featuring molecular cuisine. Live music awaited a celest. The Gostany porcelain dishes were already arranged, and then we discovered that the silver cutlery was nowhere to be found. They were expensive pieces, and Michael immediately realized that someone from the servants had decided to get rich. It's an outrage to steal past the kitchen. Only last week the guard routinely, checking bags on the way out of the shift, found the cook only mate and clippings. Galena, of course, as she did not forget that it was for the children, so because her husband has no loans to feed them. From work kicked out with a corresponding entry in the employment record, but rottenness, it seems, thoroughly penetrated the team. And she was supposed to pick them up at the car wash, Michael said. So that's the last time she saw them. I'm telling you I didn't take anything and left them here. The waitress waved her hand toward the massive buffet. The problem was that two other waitresses had entered the room after her, and they hadn't found the appliance. But there was no point in suspecting them, because when those two girls came into the room, other people also came in. Semyon, for example, who had to check the light bulb that had suddenly started flashing. And somehow it was doubtful that five people from the staff decided to get silverware. We've already checked your locker, Michael said. That leaves us with one last option. Get undressed. The banquet hall had been quiet before. The staff had been staunchly behind the angry chef's back. And now it seemed you could hear the heartbeat of the intended victim. Michael sounded the timid voice of Rick. The boy was working Ethan. How can you do that? Can you do that? Yes, you can. Grimly sealed the chief and returned menacing as a pot attention Adriana. Maybe you hid an apron in your pocket or under your skirt, a bag hanging, and in it stolen all sorts of tricks people invent to take out someone else's stuff. What do you say from personal experience? The waitress threw off her chin. The banquet hall was silent again, but now it was of a different kind. The kind that happens when a thunderstorm is about to break out, maybe even a tornado storm. What did you say? The chief couldn't believe his ears. You're out of your mind. I'll have you out of here. And nowhere else in the city in the catering you will not take even the floor of the garbage. But first you're out, then you're out. The staff, waitresses, baristas, and even the cook, Emilian, all held their breath. If Michael could read minds, he would have realized that they were ready to make a bet. That now Adriana would spit in his face and turn around and just proudly walk away, informing him beforehand that he had no right to abuse a man like that. So you want me to undress? The girl asked in a strange tone. Okay, I undressed, and she pulled the ties of the front from her uniform. The waitress uniform in satin consisted of a black pencil skirt white blouse, vest, and a black same apron with a pocket where the girls carried a pad and pencil to record orders. Ideally, of course, they should have memorized the orders, but in practice, especially with the influx of visitors, this was much more convenient. Well, check hissed at her with tape. The apron went on a short flight into Michael's hands. He caught it instinctively, but didn't even check it right away, because he was only rounding his eyes now because he hadn't expected the girl to take off her clothes. He just wanted to scare her properly to teach her a lesson so that she would cry, start to justify, beg, defend herself. 
It was just a chance to put this Adriana, who had come to work here from the very beginning, like a month ago. It pissed Michael off immensely. Right now, he was round in the eye. Why don't you check? Not enough. Okay, let's move on, grinned crooked Adriana. Following the chief's apron flew vest, but it, by the way, had no pockets. Do you think I have something interesting under my skirt too? Well, let's check it out together. The young beauty pulled the zipper down, grasped the waistband of the skirt with her fingers and pulled. An element of the uniform fell down, exposing slender legs and stockings, and what else they saw made them all gasp. Only Rick didn't see anything, because he was clamping his eyes shut, because he thought he was too decent a man to look at such a thing. But most shocked of all was Michael, who felt as if the ground were going out from under his feet, for many a calamity rivers of evidence. Ah, I didn't think I'd ever see it again. Adriana was born in the district center, around which exactly satellite. There were several villages, each boasting a rich history, and in the oldest of the villages, which was called Molochny, lived Adriana's grandparents on her mother's side. At them she spent every summer as a child, and sometimes on the winter another month. I their parents sent the children of the earliest years. Adriana, as a fairy tale remembered in the house at grandparents, and was a real Russian fairy tale. The stove, near which it was so cozy to sit. In cold rainy and studio evenings, when grandmother baked pies with jam or meat, told her granddaughter fairy tales. Grandmother knew so many fairy tales about the wise hare, who deceived the hunter about the magic carp, which helped the peasant to marry the Tsar's daughter. About children who got lost in the forest, and they almost ate Baba Yaga, but most of all liked the tales about the golden voice, who lived, lived in gory, kept their untold treasures. Stone and gemstones, whole blocks of silver and gold, scatterings of pearls. Only it is not so easy to hit the treasures of the strip mysteriously smiled, and said grandmother, only a brave man with a white soul will take them. Well, of course, many in the old days tried and thought up all sorts of tricks for this, they used to carry Polozov bread and honey and try to titillate him with songs and dances. And then long ago, one day, Adriana jumped on the spot when grandmother began to tell about voices. She demanded more tales about him and liked those stories. How a merchant drowned a whole barge with him in the river to placate him. And how poor orphans found a necklace of treasure and selling it saved their whole family from serfdom. But most of all, Adriana liked the tale of how Baron Michael decided one day that Mushichku, uneducated, it is a fool. But he'll get the treasure for sure. He would go with them from the wilderness to the capital and become a big man there. And the Tarina herself would be able to kiss his hand in the morning. Michael was a stubborn, wicked and cunning man. And he, having read books and diaries, the forbidden names of which cannot be uttered by a good man, decided that the treasures cannot be taken away so easily, but can only be exchanged. So one day Michael single-handedly harnessed a cart and set out for the foothills of the mountains. Golden voice, he shouted when he arrived at the place, come on out, bargain. Saying this, Michael drew a special sign on the ground and then struck himself on the hand with a sickle and scarlet and drops fell, soaked the ground and the earth sang like 1,000 serpents. The wind ran through the grass as if someone big had stirred in it. Fear clawed at Michael's heart with icy claws. It was necessary to run, but his greed was stronger and he, afraid to turn his back to the mountain, went to the cart, threw the rag in the cart, bound hand and foot. There lay a beautiful maiden, all Sophia. Only yesterday she had boldly approached the Baron to ask him for permission to marry the blacksmith. Michael said that it was really time for her to become a bride. The foolish girl was glad, thinking that the Baron was talking about the blacksmith. She didn't know that the Baron had planned for her a very different bridegroom. Not of the human race, not even for the idea of the sex I have. Michael shouted in a trembling voice. Look, what a beauty. Eyes green like emeralds, blue scarlet like coral tresses as if made of gold, and her teeth white as pearls. Her skin is like her neck. Michael, disregarding the squeak from under the clip, 
shielded the girl's rounded thighs with his hand, and her heart is hard to find. Thou hast a ruby as big as the heart beating in her bosom, take it polos. Let us trade with thee, standing in misery from the cart Michael in his arms, carried to the thicket of grass, and lowered to the ground, all around with good birds even the wind, and then something grabbed the maiden, and dragged her away into the widened deep that led into the bowels of the mountain. The baron went back to the cart, sat down, pulled the horse's reins and rode back without looking back. He returned with gray periods in his hair, with new wrinkles on his face, and gloomy, silent locked himself in his chambers and opened to no one. Missing. The girls, of course, noticed, but the baron told everyone that the fool must have run away and been caught by wolves or a bear. The serfs, though, said all sorts of things, but who would dare to say openly what they thought? And then two moons from the day Michael made an offering as at the mine, which belonged to Michael's family and which everyone thought was worked out, suddenly discovered deposits of all kinds of silver malachite and even colored stones. Michael became a rich man in an instant. He really went to the capital. There he found himself a noble woman's wife, noble and rich. And then, when she walked and boasted how he returned to the estate and lived as if in a fairy tale. True, it soon became clear that his wife can't stand him. She had married out of her parents' will. But the union was not infertile. A daughter was born, and they named her Betty. And how handsome was she? She grew white ruddy hair as white as flame, as red as gold, and eyes as gray as thunder dots. The time came, and Betty was betrothed, hitched to a young landowner from a neighboring estate. Michael had no heart for his only daughter, and was terribly proud that his little girl was marrying for love. On the night before the wedding Michael woke up as if from a jolt, and he suddenly wanted to look at his daughter, to admire her right now, when she would leave her parents' house and become a wife. The Baron lit a candle and entered the maiden's room. He would have cried out in terror, but the nightmare was so wild that it did not stir above the bed. Betty stood something, and at first one might have decided that it was a man as white as the moon on his face and with hair black, which like a torrent of dark river water did not match to the floor. He was dressed in black and gold robes and on each hand he had only four fingers with long, sharp claws, and on each finger was a ring, gems upon gems. Only he wasn't human after all, because his eyes were yellow and had no glasses, and his teeth were sharp, with a twin long snake's tongue slithering between them. Also a snake's tail could be seen from beneath the rich man's robes, hissed the night visitor, unbound, a golden stripe, Michael recognized him instantly. What do you want? Guess. The monster grinned, and his hands reached for sleeping Betty. You've shown me what true treasure can be. And now I want more. No. Michael dropped to his knees, reaching into both hands. Not her. Take any other surf girl I can give you. And if you want, I'll get some noblemen to come. They will come with their daughters and you can have any of them. My daughter was spared, and you're still as greedy and hearty as ever. You see, you'd buy any other's daughter to keep your own. No, I like your pearl though. Now she'll be my bride. And the floor easily took Sleeping Beauty under his arms. Is there nothing I can do to change your mind? Shook with sobs, the lingering father. Do you know? Betty said thoughtfully, can I have Siberia back? She had fun with it, and bring it back in twelve years. In the meantime, be a friend, and make sure that I'm fed and satisfied. As whispered, ready for anything, Michael. Tell the people that now I need brides, let them bring beautiful girls, and I'll exchange them for stones, cold for gold without a word, and what you people value more than the lives of your kind. Saying this Betty stepped, vanished into the darkness of the night with Betty. Of course, there was a lot of commotion when the bartender's daughter disappeared, and Michael had become quite glum. His wife, unable to bear his grief, soon faded away. The estate was falling into disrepair. Michael began to sing. Years flew by, he was completely ruined, and those around him now knew him as a crazy baron. 
who went mad from the loss of his daughter and wife. But Michael was not a quiet, crazy man at all. He would tell everyone he saw about the treasure that could be taken from the Golden Pole. People would twiddle their thumbs, of course. But Michael talked and talked. How angry was he with the world? The twelve promised years flew by. The day came when Betty was stolen by the master of the mountain. But Michael didn't go to grief. He suddenly realized that he couldn't stand it because, well, he would get Betty back. And then what? Who will need his daughter so unfortunate and disgraced? No one would marry her like that. And everyone would point the finger at them. The whole family will be disgraced. Damn it to hell. My daughter. Michael repeated like an incantation over a bottle of vodka, which he drank more often than bread. And then the Baron died. He just didn't wake up in the morning. And over time, the story was forgotten. It remained only in the legends the old men told, turned into a fairy tale. Little Adriana, when she returned to her parents in the district center, she naturally shared with him how she spent her time in the village. Her parents listened to her. Only her grandmother's fairy tales her mother did not like to listen to and told her to listen to them. She told her daughter not to pay attention to them at all. Once Adriana's mother took up her belt when the little girl started to tell her daughter a story about vines in kindergarten. They're completely crazy. Shouted at her father, Adriana Benjamin. You don't understand. These fairy tales have ruined more than one life. You can't talk about such things, replied mom. That's the same village tied then father and promised his daughter that no longer an offense will not give her. Benjamin worked on TV and mom worked at a kiosk at the bus stop. They didn't have enough money to live on. And one day my father decided that he would work in the mines in the neighboring region. In general, a friend recommended this option to him in order to go to this place. My father quickly learned to be a builder. He learned to do the simplest things. So the family's income increased, but the problems increased. Because now it turned out that almost all the time there were no adults at home. Someone had to look after Adriana. Sometimes a neighbor could help, but she didn't always have that option. In general, although there was more money, there were still problems in life. Adriana's mom was stressed now. She had no time for anything. Everything was falling out of her hands. And Adriana, who had already gone to school, began to study very badly. And teachers, and even the headmaster himself, hinted so transparent her parents that they are also to blame. They should take better care of their daughter. And then Adriana's parents decided why not send their daughter to the village. Let her grandparents raise her there. They'll probably do just as well. And they'll make money. And they would visit their daughter, of course, and take her for weekends. And then they decided that maybe they could do it even if they saved up well. Even from a rented apartment to their own. If they could get a loan. To Benjamin's parents, who could theoretically support them and their daughter. But in practice it was impossible. Because Benjamin's mother had long since remarried and came far away. And the father himself was in need of help. Suffering from a bouquet of serious illnesses and lived in a family of distant relatives. In general, there were not many options to deal with the situation. Adriana herself was very happy to return to the village. She had friends here, and she soon got used to school. Her grandparents took good care of her. Not much in the way of housework. Should I burden her? Take care of your hands. Her grandmother used to say to her sometimes, when Adriana was going to weed cheesecakes in the vegetable garden, or do some other dirty work. Let your hands be white and soft as silk. Will you be a bride? In the evenings, grandmothers often with one July in front of a large and antique in a carved frame and mirror and calm her long hair, singing songs and very beautiful voice, from which the granddaughter always soon began to sleep. You're growing up beautiful. You will soon be a bride to your grandmother. This was very often repeated and Adriana, who was already a teenager embarrassed giggled and joked that she might get married at 40 years old. She wants to study first, build a career and travel the world. Grandma, who's that? Adriana asked one day. She and her grandmother were sitting on the couch looking at a photo album. She was very interested in one photo, 
which was unusual. It turned out, for whatever reason, to be tucked under another picture. Both pictures were taken, it seems, at about the same time. Even the compositions of all the participants were the same on them, but almost all of them. In the first top photo, the grandmother was captured as a very young girl about seven years old she was. She stood with her eyes wide open and looking into the camera. Behind her back stood an old man and an old lady. Adriana knew who this grandmother and her grandmother's grandfather were. That is, they came from her great-grandmother and great-great-grandfather. In the second picture were the same people, but there was still present a young girl who had a similar face to her grandmother when she was young. It gave the impression that it was the same photo. It's just that on the second it's an unknown girl has removed edit the photo. My older sister answered my grandmother after a long pause. Sister, and I didn't know that mom was auntie. What was her name? Where do we live? Oh, I'm sorry, Adriana. I thought the question might have been unfortunate. I mean, she'd never heard of this sister. She'd never seen her before. And maybe it was because of some tragic family history. As a matter of fact, it was. Only Adriana did not yet know how tragic it was and did not see that the very essence of this story is like the roots of a mighty tree, which can spread far away from the trunk of the crown, affecting a lot of land around. But the grandmother would not tell anything. Only grumbled that enough. Say, enough to look at the photo. We should go to the text and put the pies. Adriana only shrugged her shoulders. To know about distant relatives would be interesting. But Adriana was 16 years old and had her hands full with her own affairs and worries to keep her head full of it for long. She'd finished another grade, waiting as she always did for her dad and mom to come and pick her up for the weekend, and even for a whole vacation they'd spend together, as they always did in the city. In the meantime, while waiting for that to happen, Adriana was enjoying the first few days of school vacation, and to her amazement, watched the relationship between her grandparents deteriorate. They often quarreled. What's wrong? Adriana asked him or her. Nothing, answered her grandmother. Never mind, everything is fine, Grandpa replied. They also often argued heatedly, but always fell silent. As soon as Adriana was nearby, Grandmother often drank heart drops, and Adriana could hear it at night. Grandma cried a lot and kept repeating the same name, Kathy. One day, Grandma dared to talk to Adriana. Grandma, I can't take it anymore. What's going on? One of you is seriously ill, and you don't know how to tell me. And who is Kathy? Christina first looked at her granddaughter like a ghost, then cried again, but then wiped her tears with a handkerchief and invited her to sit down next to her. It's just that Grandpa says you don't need to know all this. He says that maybe it will go away, maybe it will never come back. It's a disaster in our house. I can't take it anymore, granddaughter. Do you have to know that? If we're going to save my dear face, it's better for you to know. So you'll be careful. I'll tell you everything as it is. He's talking. It all happened when she was just a girl. The world was a very different place then. It was the end of the 30s and the village was going through hard times. There was a man called William who ran the place. He was a strict, even cruel man used to doing things his own way. William came from the poorest strata of the population, as they say, and he couldn't stand those who were left of the old world. And so it was fate and chance that William became chairman of the collective farm. And in fact, people expected the worst from him. But it turned out that there were positive sides to this man. He was hardworking and giving others hard work himself to take on twice as much. He did not drink and did not even smoke. He strictly monitored that the Colco's good flourished, and little by little people began to warm to William. They began to say that with such a leadership the village would go far in the sense that it would show everyone. Record harvests, high milk yields, and all that. William, by the way, was a family man. He had a wife and a daughter. William adored the latter more than anything else in the world. People used to joke that she was more valuable to him than the collective farm, and lived then in the power of Marlowe very well all. But suddenly everything changed. 
two years of crop failure, the fall of cattle, and on top of that, not before the delivery of the Kolkos property, were found in such volumes that everyone became frightened. But as if these troubles were not enough, only William lost his family. It happened when his daughter and his wife went burying in the forest for blueberries. People couldn't understand why they took a bitter turn, where all the inhabitants of Soap Tea had never seen berries, but only found their car in the tall grasses. At first people thought that the mother and daughter had fallen asleep while basking in the sun, but it turned out to be an eternal sleep. Naturally, the local paramedic and people from the city who came to this case wanted to understand what happened, and they found the answer. They said that a poisonous snake had bitten both vipers, only the people of the town. Little T were very surprised, because the snakes not poisonous unusual in the neighborhood had not seen long ago even the old-timers. William was crushed with grief. For the first time in his life, he reached for a drink, and there were some bastards who gave him a drink willingly. Obviously, there's only one man left in the world. We can spoil him now. For vodka, William began to take out of the house everything that could be sold. Over time, his hands came to the point of dismantling the trunk that had been inherited from his great-grandfather. William and life are not attracted to him, so kept and out of respect for the memory of ancestors, but now began to dig there. Maybe something valuable to sell ready to find. Old rags, turned to dust, wooden painted spoons, a couple of coins from the Tsarist era of Kopex, an old book, it was lying on the hut itself, and even under it. It turned out that there was a false one in the chest. What is this nonsense? What a marvel? William thought. Looking at the book, he did not understand the ancient language, but William's great-great-grandfather was a schoolteacher, and in his time did not spare in them neither nettles nor belt, and even sticks were not spared to beat in the head of his great-grandson any knowledge. And so William was able to make out what the book was about. This book was written in the 18th century, and it spoke of the abomination of the extreme, that is, of witchcraft. William, such nonsense. Even when I wasn't a believer, but now I'm no other way than a hangover. The thing was that the book talked about how you can bed away from a person or from the settlement of a whole, about how one could get great wealth. The plight of his native collective farm gave William no less peace than the death of his family. So he made up his mind. Soon the villagers noticed that William had changed. He still drank and became even more sullen, but he stopped locking himself up at home and went wandering towards the mountain more and more often. What was he doing there? Why was he wandering alone? People shrugged their shoulders and said that, apparently, the Russian had gone mad and apparently there would soon be another chairman of the collective farm. And then one day William came to Bracker. Well, that is Christina's family. He had a long talk with its heads. Christina's grandparents are quite old. And the Brackers, by the way, were longtime debtors to William, because it was he who had once helped them avoid having the last Ukrainian woman taken away. And now, so to speak, it was time to return the favor. Zima was still small, and everyone thought she was a booger and didn't understand anything, but she did. And she was also able to be stealthy and quiet as a mouse and therefore heard and understood much more. She learned what the adults thought would remain their secret, a dark, cruel secret. And so Christina overheard one day, sitting in the cellar. As above her talk Russian and old men that you can get untold riches and the pestilence of cattle. If you ask for help from the golden voice, only not empty-handed petitioner should go to him. One must present him with a treasure. Little Christina was so surprised that old people believe in fairy tales, and also that day when William said he would go to the lane, she quietly ran after him from the summer. William had already told everyone that day that he would go to the berry patch. William didn't go alone, Kathy was with him, and Christina's grandparents. People were surprised and overjoyed at the same time, thinking that he had apparently decided to return to normal life, that he had come to terms with the loss of his daughter and wife. People also said that William must have planned to marry Kathy. After all, 
It's no good for a man like that to be a widower until he's old, and people also reasoned that it was the right thing to do. Very right, because Kathy was a real disgrace to the Bracker family. She had to be fixed right away. She was too bold with her free will, saying that she would soon go to the city, and there she would live with a man for nothing. Because marriage is a bourgeois remnant. Then this Tom with the city students that came to the practice was confused and said even that she got pregnant from one, and then to Grandmother Nira, who had the fame of a sorceress, ran to get rid of the pregnancy. With a tail, following the paths while the shock and her relatives went deeper into the forest, they entered it from the side of the mountain and walked for a very long time. Finally, the adults came to a clearing of the forest Around stood Malachite Wall. It was very quiet here, and the birds were not singing. And in two steps darkened the foot of the mountain and no berries. What? Christina was surprised. There weren't any. Only trees here were very strange with trunks feathers steeper on the ground grass was growing. Holy as countrywoman. She realized that the adults had come to the place where she was dying, calling her seven years old. Christina was clever. And it must have been that cleverness, and also some ancient instinct that warned people of danger, that prevented her from screaming in fear and in comprehension of what she was watching. The fact was that William suddenly jumped on Kathy, hit her hard, and then tied her to a tree with a rope. Grandma and Grandpa just stood back and watched this. Kathy, naturally, lashed out, screaming, asking why was she being treated like this. You're a disgrace said the old lady. She's not a granddaughter. At least you'll do some good, said the old man. Forgive us, granddaughter, but through your sacrifice our whole village will be saved. All honest people will live well. We won't forget you, added the grandmother. We will remember you with kind words and ways. William, meanwhile, was drawing some signs on the ground, muttering strange words, and then he lit a small fire and began to pound some powder into it. Strange smelling smoke, Kathy coughed. She was still twitching at her points, screaming, begging, crying, threatening to tell all the people the truth. But gradually it weakened and finally quieted down. William the same with the old men, and all this time stood aside. Where the smoke almost did not reach, they were clamped mouths, noses, rags to stink more dramatic to breathe. And then the woman who was closest to her sister suddenly heard a noise from outside. There was a rumbling under the ground, as if a whole train was coming. Suddenly, the ground shook, and then an animal howl rang out over the meadow, and then a wild, mad laughter. What beasts? What birds could be capable of that? Zinchenko was below dead with fear, and she would have snapped, rushed away, but she could not leave her sister. She loved her sister very, very much. In an instant, she forgot how Kathy had patted her with a towel for Christina dragging her lipstick and spilling her perfume. She had forgotten how Kathy had thrown the housework on her and how she herself had run away to a dance at the village club. Now all the strength, all the courage of a loner served but one purpose. She must save her sister. And then, following the sounds of wondrously no fairy tale monsters were capable of, came the movement of the grass, moving. There crawled a giant snake. William and the old men also saw and heard everything, similar, for they suddenly shouted and were frightened and rushed away. And then Christina ventured out of her hiding place. The smoke had almost cleared already, but still she could barely see, barely breathe, ran up to the tree. Christina started to untangle the ropes. Kathy, sweet Kathy, Wake up. Tears came flooding down. Finally, the ropes lifted and her sister fell to her knees, coughing and vomiting. Little Kathy put her shoulder to her, and they staggered precisely crippled. The chortles moved from the glade away. There was a hill just beyond it, and the smoke didn't reach it nearly as far. There was also a stream running through there. Christina and Kathy fell down in front of it and began to drink the icy water greedily and looked at their faces with it. Thank you, Kathy whispered hoarsely. Kathy, why are they sodding like that? Asked Christina. 
I don't know, shook her head Kathy. I'm going to the city, run away. Start a new life. I'll come with you volunteered Christina, clinging to her sister. You won't. Kathy sighed. She stroked her sister's head. Your mom and dad and grandpa are mean. It wasn't until Christina was older that she realized why Kathy couldn't take Kathy with her back then. There was a girl missing, an 18-year-old runaway. It's bad enough, but it's still a tolerable event. If a child goes missing, then everyone will be out looking for her. You can't go far. Besides, despite the fact that the eldest of the family had clearly gone mad, joining William, who had gone mad. But there was still mom and dad. Liam and Vanessa. Liam was a tractor driver and in the coming weeks he was going to take the family, move to the neighboring state farm in the village of Kalina. Vanessa was to get a job as a school teacher there as well. Kathy realized that of course her parents were needed. They loved her, adored her, they would take care of her. She, well, what's the sin, had been so herself that the people who could have been family to her fully, they drifted away. So now how could she run to them for help? And besides, Kathy realized that if she went and told everyone that William had done this to her, where's the guarantee that there's such a reputation for being a slutty and bad girl that anyone would believe it? Yes. And then there's the possibility of revenge for the truth being revealed. And wouldn't that revenge affect Zina and her parents? And Kathy made a decision. Christina. She looked her little sister in the eye. Let's get serious. You're a big girl. You saved me, and you want me to be okay. Then listen, Kathy spent a long time explaining some very important things to her little sister. And then they stood up from the ground, hugged each other tightly, and said goodbye. But before they separated in different directions, they looked together in the direction where the mountains towered and where over the clearing, whether the smoke was still increasing or the fog, what kind of fog was running? Do you see? Kathy asked suddenly. And more tightly, clutching her shoulder, nestled against her sisters, she whispered to Christina. Down there they suddenly imagined that from the shadows of the forest appeared a human figure of a man, black hair, dressed in a long hollow caftan black with gold embroidery, appeared for a moment flashed yellow eyes and disappeared. Had you imagined it? said Kathy and Christina nodded. I agree with her completely. Back home, Christina packed up what she wanted for the river, finished in the sunshine, and fell asleep. Overslept. That's why she was gone so long. I think they believed her. Only her grandfather and grandmother looked suspiciously. But the loner didn't give anything away. Then, of course, there was an uproar that everyone had left the forest without finding berries. And Kathy stayed behind wanting to look for more. And then she disappeared. She was not found by Christina's parents and many villagers, who were still kind to the girl, cried, deciding that she was lost when she wandered into the swamp or the beast got a tooth. And only once the grandfather and grandmother exchanged a quiet phrase between themselves about the fact that, apparently, he also accepted the offerings in the form of the girl's body. Much later, looking back on her life, Christina realized exactly the day when the fate of her older sister was decided. She had grown up abruptly, and life went on. Vanessa and Liam moved to another village with their daughter. Sometimes they went to visit their elderly parents, grandparents from the winter. By the way, in the same winter went away one by one fever took down and carried away. By the way, the Kolko's business began to improve. The cattle got better. Milk yields increased, and the next year's harvest was unprecedented. William, however, was not even happy about it all, because he got drunk again, and eventually he was thrown out of the chairman's post. And then he moved from the village to the city to a distant relative, and died there soon after. Christina, by the way, was nearby. Her parents had just returned to stay with their relatives. When the neighbors were clearing out his house, but as she realized, they hadn't found the black book of witchcraft that Marlowe used to read the spell in the woods. It was gone. Christina was ten years old when she suddenly received a letter. The envelope had a name she didn't recognize, and the letter came from Kamchatka. 
She was surprised and thought there was a mistake, but it turned out to be a letter Kathy had written in it. She reported that she was doing well, that she had finished technical school as a seamstress, got married, married a good man, and even they had a child already. Kathy thanked her little sister for saving her and told her to burn the letter after reading it for safety and to keep it secret. Kathy promised that she would still write occasionally. And so far throughout their lives, the sisters did exchange letters. When Adriana heard the whole story, she was shocked because it all seemed completely unbelievable, fabulously crazy, except that Baba Cristina was a materialist. She didn't even believe in omens with empty buckets and other trivialities of village folklore, and it didn't look like she was fantasizing. In her old age, born of reason, Grandma, why did you tell me all this? Adriana asked, evil, granddaughter, but time has no control over these things. Well, my face is what you need to know. And Christina spoke again. When she grew up, she had time to study, to marry, to divorce, to remarry, to give birth to a daughter. That is, Adriana's mother, a man suddenly came to the village where Christina lived. He came from the city and seemed to be an unremarkable character. Few town people come to breathe fresh air and drink milk, except that his surname, as I heard accidentally in a conversation in the car, in line for bread, so cut on the ears concussion. And then this Marlowe once visited the library, where Christina worked and started a conversation with her. And she almost sat up from what he said. This man turned out to be not only a relative of this William Marlowe, but also a man to whom William had confided her secrets on the eve of her death, and he began to ask Zina if she knew what had happened to Kathy. William was tormented. His conscience was bothering him. With courtly sympathy, Jack said, he had nightmares. My sister disappeared when she went berry picking in the woods. Zenith managed by some miracle to stay calm outwardly. And if what William said was true, then he'd be in trouble. He didn't get much for that in his lifetime. But Jack persisted. He told that William in a dream was the golden polos himself, and he accused William that he asked for fortune for his native land and could not bring normal sacrifices. And do you know what the most interesting thing is? Jack continued. He took a handkerchief out of his pocket, unfolded it, and placed it on the table in front of Zina. Christina was a simple woman, and all sorts of jewels of life did not see, but immediately realized that it is not glass in front of her. They are the very treasure, the bowels of the earth, gems that were mined in these parts long ago. I'm a geologist by trade, Jack said. And you know what's curious. Everything says there's nothing else of value in these mountains. But then how come I found this near that clearing William told me about? Why? Christina's voice trembled at last. Why are you showing me all this? Why are you telling me? No reason, Jack grinned. Maybe we could help each other. I don't know what you mean. It didn't get scary. A noisy group of school children came through the library door. They'd come to turn in the books they'd borrowed for summer reading. I'm busy. I put a sternness in my son's voice. And you, citizen, apparently, should drink less vodka and not wander too much in your forests. They say there are poisonous vapors in the swamps, and they say they can give you a headache. What is it? Jack squinted. He was no longer trying to look friendly. How do you want it? I replied suggesting that the two of us split the brain. Why didn't Kathy come forward? Why didn't she reveal the ugly truth? Growing up, Christina wondered about that more than once. Maybe it was because her sister wanted to leave the family long ago, and there was such an occasion. If it wasn't for luck, as they say, how could she have known? It wasn't Grandpa and Grandma or William who were up to any more mischief. Was she really so sure that old people loved and harmed Liam and Vanessa's little sister. It was probably also coming to conclusions in Christina's mind that Kathy was still afraid of not being believed. She might just be told she was crazy to talk like that. And then she would probably be in a danger that she might not be able to avoid. I've been doing a lot of thinking, Christina, about this mysterious Jack, and she couldn't get her head around it. Here's the thing. 
Okay, William, from vodka, to losing his wife and child. He's insane. But how could a city-educated man come to believe in the same creepy streak? And how far was he willing to go? Kristina no longer knew what to expect. She waited that there would appear in their neighborhood geologists, who would begin to develop the bowels of the earth. She even expected that people would suddenly talk about the disappearance of some young girl, but neither of these things happened. And Jack never showed up again. And life went on as before, nice and quiet. Her daughter grew up. The world changed. So all that was left to do was move and guess at the coffee grounds. What would happen next? It was painful for Christina to watch her native land change in the 90s. She disliked those who were called New Russians and was glad that at least they did not go to them, did not build all sorts of businessmen, suspicious of their cottages here. Time flew by, a new 1,000 years came. And one day Christina realized that in body she had grown old, but with her mind she was still young. It was such a contradiction that it was frustrating. Christina loved her daughter very much, but even more loved her granddaughter Adriana. This girl seemed to be her own reflection from the distant past, and then the past appeared as a heavy, dark ghost, and it all started when the town folk came to the village. And all right, they were just people, but chief among them was a Russian named Ethan. Christina first encountered him when she was leaving the post office to collect her pension and almost got under the wheels of a jeep. The car braked with an ugly squeal. The door swung open and a man in a suit and shoes, and strange things jumped out, fussed, and held out his hand to help me stand up. He apologized and then introduced himself. You must be Christina, he smiled, showing off his gold teeth. The two front ones had been replaced by them. That's when the old lady's heart sank into her heels. How did he know her? He'd never seen her before in his life. Oh, it's not for nothing, but I've heard from you. He smiled at her like old friends and held her hand tightly. Oh, like breaking an old lady's bones, though they say you're the best expert on the history of this area. Christina exhaled. Could she be wrong? Because she seemed to understand what the man was talking about. The thing is that for about 15 years, Christina had been moonlighting as a tour guide because in the surrounding villages and in the district center, there were a lot of all sorts of architectural monuments, museums as many as two, and even fascinating natural beauty. And Christina on hunting was already at the age of a pensioner, but she loved life. She was eager for all kinds of activity. And so she found an outlet for herself. She worked as a tour guide for tourists, in general. At first, younger colleagues from several tourist bureaus laughed at her. They said, we're old women to meddle in this field, but then quieted down because Christina, a lot of interesting not banal, could tell about the history of culture, native, places, and each tour with her was not like the previous one. That is, she already known spoke and fresh new added, but she told a joke with a busy fact so that many people were on her excursions even repeatedly. In general, there was such an activity for Christina's soul, and a boost to her pension, of course. Christina tried to reassure herself that there aren't many people named Marlow. And even if he is related to that Jack, so what? Maybe, and really in front of her, a person fascinating, educated. Ethan, by the way, as it turned out, really turned out to be a relative of Jack and straight, he was his son. Ethan said that he was a businessman, the owner of several jewelry salons, and would like to get acquainted with the works of local masters of Malachite and Semetsvedi, who created back in the days of serfdom. We have such a thing, Christina said. I have such a permanent exposition in the museum in the district center. True, the entrance there is not free, but by appointment of an individual tour for a small group. There can be up to 10 people. I'd love to say if you'll take me. Dear Christina smiled at Ethan. The sun glinted, and on his golden teeth the old woman had a jest of association. Like a beast insulted, ravenous, implying that he was planning to hunt. And so just after this meeting told Christina the story of her family, granddaughter Adriana, you should know how dangerous. Maybe any man who bears the surname Marlowe. Apparently, some knowledge of the secret William passed on to them. 
Perhaps they will not go to what their ancestor dared, or perhaps all their madness. Greed ruthlessness struck, and Adriana listened to her grandmother very carefully. She was shocked by the story, which was like the script of a Hollywood thriller. But Adriana was also a teenager, and so she was inclined to look at the world in a special way with faith in the best, with the certainty that whatever horror was going on there, it would not affect her. And she also decided that all the terrible things happened a long time ago. And nowadays, who would believe in a creature that was half snake and half man? Leading a warrior with a proud treasure. That's ridiculous. It's just nonsense. So Adriana promised her grandmother she'd be very careful. But she quickly put it all out of her mind. She was so young, and she had her own worries. One of the next days, Adriana's grandparents went into town. They had to go to the hospital for their annual checkup. They were going to go through many doctors in a day. Adriana refused to go with them. What should I do? She asked, sitting in the clinic all day. Adriana decided that she would stay at home and prepare dinner for the old people's return. She also exercises her modeling gait. Yes, Adriana dreamed that after graduation she would not go to university, but become a top model. And she was, by the way, offended that adults laugh at her dream. They say, no, it won't work. So they don't decide anything for her. And just as the time was getting past 12 o'clock, there was a knock on the door. Adriana thought that it was her old people who came back early and opened the door without even asking who it was, and Ethan himself was behind the threshold. And in the first few moments of their meeting, Adriana was struck with a sense of danger like lightning. Good afternoon, Ethan said. He asked politely for Christina. The girl replied that she was not at home. That's a shame. And I so needed to talk to her. About what? Maybe something to tell her. Not much tea and, and Kalina. I wanted to ask you to clarify something, Ethan said. It's just that I'm going out of town on a beauty pageant. Really? Adriana is roundly classy. She didn't realize she'd just taken the bait like a stupid pawn. Do you have a daughter in the pageant? I, unfortunately, don't have a daughter yet, or even a wife. Ethan sighed. He had a knack for talking, almost like a hypnotist. And here he had already surrounded the girl with the web he needed. Mole, the rhythm of life of a successful businessman does not leave time to find a worthy girlfriend of life. And at the contest he acts as sponsors, as a member of the jury. Adriana could not resist and said that she dreams of becoming a model. Ethan asked why then he and her name. The heart of the list of contestants in this competition has not seen. After all, it is such a great opportunity to start a modeling career. Adriana replied embarrassed that she sent a questionnaire, but it was rejected because the participation is 17 years old only she is 16. What nonsense. I will personally talk to the organizer. I think. He took her hand and kissed it. He'll make an exception for such a nymph. But it would be better to show up in person, of course. After all, today is the preliminaries for the finals. Adriana was thrilled. She believed that thanks to the patronage of an influential man, she would be allowed to enter the finals even after passing the previous stage. She said she'd be there in a jiffy, just a jean jacket on the street of noticeably cold July from the village to the car, and a jeep with tinted windows drove from the village. He turned off the main road and onto a side road that didn't lead to the city, but was lost somewhere behind the mountain. Ethan had already thought it over. He decided that he would say that the girl in the middle of the road had asked him to drop her off. And for that he even threw Adriana's purse out of the window at some point in the field. Let them find it, follow a false trail. And the girl was already lying by the clutch at that moment. In the backseat of his car, the victim was almost ready. If someone 15 years ago, Michael said that he would become a restaurant manager, he would only have laughed. Because, well, what kind of career in the restaurant, if he is the maximum that knows how to fry eggs, and fish fork from fork desserts cannot distinguish? No. Michael from a young age was accustomed to the fact that he was to continue, so to speak, the family dynasty of doctors-psychiatrists. True, 
He had no special inclination to the science of human marasmus. But when you are indoctrinated from childhood that you must and must, in general, by the end of school everything was clear, and the university was appropriate supervision. Father, by the way, slightly violating the doctor's ethics, told a lot about his patients, considering it a kind of training for easy entry into the profession. Noah talked about it so often that Michael even began to fear that one day he himself would go crazy. Actually, then he thought for the first time that maybe, what it is, if Michael had nightmares, he thought that maybe they were signs of some kind of disorder. And if he forgot his phone at home, wouldn't that be a sign of dementia at an early age? Anyway, the guy was a nervous wreck. Noah was suggesting sedatives or snapping at his psychos. Michael, unnormal. Soon the fear of one day becoming crazy myself became something routine and habitual. Sort of chronic, but still lumber. You know, son, one day my mom said to Michael, you would now before the first session starts, go on vacation go to my brother. Mom's brother's name was Jacob. He lived in the South, ran a cafe in a resort town. Michael agreed lukewarmly. Why not? He didn't mind doing nothing before diving headfirst into his studies. It was there on the Black Sea coast that a dramatic change happened to him. Just one day Jacob asked for help in the kitchen. The cook alone is sick, but I don't know how. Michael stepped in himself. Why can't you peel potatoes? Raised his eyebrows uncle. The first day she, however, only peeled potatoes and chopped mushrooms. But on the second day, Jacob told him to put less cream sauce on the stove and then taught him how to shape and marinate fish. And by the time the real cook came home from sick leave, Michael was already in. Now he knew what he wanted to do with his life. Naturally, at home did not do without a scandal. Mom cried. Dad threatened to kick her out of the house and insinuated that someone was hysterical. For me, what's a lady's diagnosis from the 19th century? Michael snapped with a chuckle. Dad, I don't want to fight. Just realize that each person has his own way in life. How you talk, Noah said, but they made up. Of course, there were more attempts to talk, but in the end, the family accepted Michael's choice. And Michael, purely out of respect for his father, did not turn his back on psychiatry. And he and his parents talked about it a lot. His father shared with him news from the world, science, medicine from his field, and also sometimes told stories about patients. And one story especially touched Michael. It turned out that once his father together with other psychiatrists had to treat one curious patient. He was a respectable businessman. They say such people are the cream of society, but he suddenly shocked everyone by attacking a girl. Can you believe it? They had a family history of schizophrenia and suspected schizophrenia. And even though it's not scientifically proven to be hereditary, and there are versions of it, my father's story is full of gruesome details that this businessman on the verge of bankruptcy suddenly decided to turn to an old family legend that you can get untold riches through one mystical creature, namely the legendary golden voice, which supposedly keeps in the mountains of treasure deposits of precious stones. And okay, you're just a mystic man. So he decided that sacrifice was the way to go. So he kidnapped the girl, took her to the woods at the foot of the mountain. And there, in general, the poor girl would have died. Probably, if only it had not happened in the same place to pass a company of mushroomers. They spooked the maniac. Look what I'll show you, said Father Michael. Well, I'm actually drinking tea, pitifully stretched then, not yet far from the manager of the restaurant, and put aside the sausage sandwich. Father shoved a photograph under his nose. In general, this homegrown sorcerer decided that the symbols of sex appeal should not be carved on the ground. In general, many girls served as a kind of whip for Moldavian charms. A mushroom picker filmed it, thinking to sell the story to journalists. No, of course, people sometimes amaze me. Fortunately, he didn't sell it, said Noah, but he gave you the photo, said Michael. For science, Noah almost took offense. I never showed it to anyone but you, by the way. It's evidence of that, Dad tapped the photo with his finger.
how bizarrely other people's minds can be twisted. I can't even begin to imagine what the poor girl went through. How is he with sincere sympathy? Michael asked. She was a tough girl. Scars, of course, for life. I talked to her, by the way, and asked her about Ethan. You had to see the whole picture of his behavior, so to speak. She held on and she has a mother, father, grandparents. All in all, there's family to support. That's important, son. Michael did not consider himself a particularly impressionable person, but this picture was firmly lodged in his brain. Sometimes he even had nightmares about it. The girl's body in the forest clearing her face, he could never make out. There is so that it could not be seen. In these dreams Michael knew he had to confront something dark, cruel, but he could not move. All he could do was watch helplessly as the girl, whose face he still could not see, approached. Something nightmarish was coming. This day, by the way, when everything had gone so wrong at the restaurant, he had woken up again from that nightmare. And then Adriana drove him crazy. 21 years old, a part-time student at a teacher's college. Smart girl, so all right, neat, without bad habits and even words parasites in the speech is not. Never flirts with restaurant guests. In general, a kind of girl from the provinces who kept such a rare today purity of soul. Yes, Michael knew she came from some backwoods village to the city to study. Yes, she pissed him off. And it came out naturally. True, at first he was only covered with some vague anxiety when she appeared in sight. And he couldn't understand what was the matter. She was just an ordinary waitress, an ordinary girl. Well, maybe very pretty. I can't take that away from her. But why does he feel so weird around her? And then one day they got into a fight. Just one day, a poorly dressed old man came into the cafe. He sat down at the table, read the menu for a long time, flipping the pages with his finger, which every now and then caught the drool. Yes, the menu understood, Michael will go to throw away. And the shell-shaped chair is designer. By the way, the furniture will go to the dry cleaner. Then the old man ordered a glass of water and the cheapest dish. Administrator Molly approached the guest, who clearly did not meet the level of the institution, and tried to politely escort him out. And almost succeeded. But then Adriana flew up and it started. She stood up for the old man and said that she would pay for his lunch. And then she started talking to him. It turned out, by the way, that he wasn't homeless just lost in the city. Luckily, the number of a relative was in his phone. Button came and picked up the old man. Michael later reprimanded Adriana for intervening. Another time, he did not like the fact that she snapped at a guest. This visitor, unlike the old man, was decent and actually came here a lot. It was a famous blogger. She made an unfortunate joke about Adriana not knowing the ingredient of a fancy dish. She said something, and it just went viral. The blogger, by the way, promised to keep Atlas among her 1 million subscribers. But luckily, she didn't seem to follow through on that threat. Michael then spent a week monitoring her page. He looked at the scene before him and felt bad. It was like heaven and earth had changed places, like the room had run out of air. He just couldn't stop looking at those feet. Yeah, compared to the fresh, if you could call it that, picture. It looked better now. Neater. Such a definition for the fancy vase scars covering a woman's legs from her hips and almost to her knees was almost physical. The sensation was nauseating. Michael took a deep breath, then exhaled with a quiet, hoarse sound. It was her. Adriana turned out to be the same poor girl he yearned to save so many times in his nightmares. Adriana turned out to be the very victim he felt so genuinely sorry for. More than once in all these years, he had intended to go to his father and ask him how the village girl was doing. Couldn't he find out anything about her fate? Or maybe she needed some help. Michael never did. Why didn't he? Well, he felt like a complete idiot for intending to interfere in someone else's life. He probably shouldn't have gotten her story in the first place. And now? What? Now he knew everything. And what's more, Michael had never felt so disgusted with himself in his life.
If he could just hit her harder, like she had done for him. I mean, she looked at him in such a way that if he could fall through the ground to that very lane, he would do it with great pleasure. Maybe that would atone for what he'd just done. I don't know. I don't think there's anything I can do about it. Adriana. Michael slipped his jacket off his shoulders and held it out to her. Don't, please don't. She asked. And the grin on her lips and the grin that would have slapped him in front of everyone honestly. I thought that's what you were after. So did everybody see it? Did you enjoy the show? She didn't take his jacket. Instead, she pulled up his skirt, zipped it up. I quit. She spit it out and you dashed out of the room. Heather, what kind of idiot am I? Michael paced his office and prepared to tear the hair out of his head. He missed the moment. He should have rushed right after Adriana. But he stood there with her apron in his hands like a complete moron. But he could only think of himself as an asshole now. And then, when he came to his senses and ran out after her, he realized he was too late. She had already changed, leaving her waitress uniform in the staff locker room. And gone. Where to? In principle, Michael quickly realized that the address of registration, residence, that is, the address of the student dormitory, you can find out if you look in the personnel department. But then what? He couldn't just go to her and say I apologize for the awkward situation. By the way, I know you were almost killed by a crazed maniac a few years ago, and that's why I care about you in a weird way. Why don't we discuss this over coffee? The silverware that started it all. They went in almost as soon as Adriana left, by the way. Turns out they were accidentally dropped behind the buffet. In front of that staff. By the way, Michael was also very embarrassed about the scene he had made. Now they naturally had every reason to consider him a nutcase, an autocrat, a pervert. Perhaps rumors about this outrage will reach even the owner of the institution, and then he may even be fired. But it didn't matter anyway. In fact, it seemed like it couldn't get any worse. If only Michael knew that in this negative plan there are no limits and boundaries. From thinking and walking along the closed mini route of a conditional animal in a cramped zoo cage, he was brought out by a knock on the door. I'm busy. Leave me alone. Michael bellowed. Sure it's that bad. There was a voice that sounded very familiar. Michael opened the door with a jerk and almost fainted because the last person he expected to see was his uncle. Jacob exhaled. His nephew grinned into his grandfather's mustache. So this is my bad timing. You apologize for the unannounced visit. Just got off the train and straight here. I really wanted to surprise you and to see where you live. No, he shook his head. Michael finally fueled him up for the joy of meeting you. They hadn't seen each other in years. Somehow, life got a little crazy out there. Come on in, Jacob, come on in. I wasn't expecting it. I didn't expect it either. Uncle came into the office. Everything, you know, things are pulling in all directions. And then I thought, time goes on, life goes on. Why am I sitting here? My relatives, that's the most important thing. You can't do that. So I decided, and I flew off without me. It won't fall apart in a few days, but maybe I'm not in time after all. No, he ran his hand nervously through his hair. What makes you think that? You don't look like yourself, Jacob replied. While I was coming to you, the staff is following me as if the lion is hunting mice. What happened? Yeah, it happened. You wouldn't believe that you dropped Michael's head. No, I know life happens. So now Jacob was looking expectant. Ouch, nephew. Not only are you silent, as if you've already started to scold me for something, but you don't know how to receive guests. Not even offered tea. And what did I do for you? Only taught you. That's right. I'm sorry you're like this. Let's go to lunch and talk about it. That's a different conversation. Jacob smiled. Let's see what kind of inn this is. You run the place. They went into the hall, chose a free table, and sat down. Lisa brought the menu. Jacob asked her nephew's advice and ordered. That fateful summer for Michael, when he realized what he wanted to do in life. 
He also gained another truly kind-hearted person. Jacob was the kind of interlocutor to whom you could pour out your soul, who will never rebuke the empty, but also pretend to agree with everything. If they didn't, they wouldn't. And now, when Michael had the opportunity to talk about everything, he immediately felt relief, as if he had thrown off his shoulders, surrounded by Stone's basket. He told Jacob all about Adriana and his attitude toward her. Jacob listened attentively without interrupting, and it seemed as if he were only listening, while he was busy eating. Michael, who was well aware of the fact that his uncle never hurries to say important things, First, he thinks three times about what to say he did not rush him. Tell me, what am I to do now? Michael sighed. Dessert was just being served. Molly curious about the voices. Michael flashed his eyes in response and waved his head, saying shoo away and you won't get any food for gossip. You should go to her, Jacob replied. Just like that, Michael stretched out frustratedly, his face cupped in the palm of his hand with a groan. Impossible. What kind of miracle recipe for solving all this did you expect me to give you? He grinned. He looked very serious and even stroked. You are still young, though not so young on the other hand. But since you asked for my opinion and advice, here it is. Sometimes the most complex issues are solved by the simplest method. It's like the bread recipe, nephew. Remember what I told you. You can bake it to be served to the king. Michael replied, There is nothing like the ordinary bread that was baked in your ancestral home. I remember my uncle smiling sadly, talking about how sometimes the simplest things are the best, the most important, and the most needed. But what if she won't listen? But she might listen, Jacob said, carefully scooping a forest of mango belts into a spoonful of bitter chocolate frosting. He tasted the dessert. It was original. There's nothing to say. It's delicious, but I'm not a desert man. So I'm just saying it's delicious. Okay, Michael nodded. He felt better for the first time. So I'm going to her place tomorrow. But it was a little more complicated than that, because first it was to the dormitory, where he showed up with a bouquet of roses. Michael decided that such an addition to a sincere apology would not be superfluous. He was told that Adriana had not been seen at all, but he was lucky. Her roommate was just passing by and told him that Adriana had packed up last night and was rushing to the train station to go home to her grandparents. Her dad and mom are there too. They decided to spend their vacation in the village. What should she do in the city? She shrugged her shoulders. She lost her job. By the way, do you know why? No, Michael barely got out of himself and blushed like a tomato because he didn't introduce himself in full form that he was the manager of the very restaurant from which Adriana had quit. As he realized, Adriana hadn't told her roommate the details, just said goodbye to her. I see. Stretched thoughtfully cast him a curious look. She, seeing the roses in his hands, decided that he was Adriana's suitor. Anyway, I think she's in the village until the session starts. Soon to be a couple weeks and a tale. Why do you really want her? Very much, Michael. Have you lost your cell phone? Or she ignored you? Raised her eyebrows meaningfully. Believe me, it's complicated. Michael wasn't going to tell me everything. And thank you very much. He thanked and walked away from the dormitory. The plan had changed. Now he had to call the owner of the restaurant. Apologize and say that I had to miss a day of work. And he also had to stop by the house to pack his things because Michael had decided that he was going to the village he was going tomorrow. Adriana was already used to living in the city, and she realized that she would stay there after graduation. And there if very lucky, then in the next three to four years we'll be able to take a mortgage. But still the city with all its opportunities and joys could not overshadow her native village. That nightmare when she found herself on the walls. Six eternity. Hours in the captivity of a maniac, didn't just turn Adriana's life upside down, didn't just leave scars on her body. She had become a different person. Yes, outwardly she was a strong girl. She coped with everything, but she withdrew into herself, finished school with everyone smiling, visiting her in the hospital, relatives and friends. 
She repeated 100 times that the main thing was that she was alive, and the rest will come with it. But no one, not even those psychologists, psychiatrists, in conversations with whom Adriana spent so many hours, no one knew what was going on in her soul. Her moments of fear had caused Adriana to lose many of her perceptions of the world around her and of herself. She was glad when Teresa in her monster in human form was locked up, declared insane. But at times it still seemed to have power over her. Sometimes she had nightmarish dreams. In them, Adriana found herself at the foot of the mountain, helpless and clothed. For some reason in a snow-white bridesmaid's dress. In these, it was night, as always. And then someone who appeared out of the darkness grabbed her by the arm and dragged her into the unknown. Adriana fought back desperately in such dreams, but in the end she was still dragged into the darkness, and there she fell for an endless long time, and then always woke up at the end, and gradually Adriana began to accept the scary dreams as just an ordinary part of her life. And life went on. The young girl listened to the then wise advice, the grandmother of best friends, that it was better not to give interviews, not to let herself be photographed or videotaped and that by doing so, her whole story would soon be forgotten. Adriana also pretty quickly refused to talk to a psychologist. He reasoned that now she herself to her own taste, and also, of course, if it is convenient for work, can, so to speak, restore its potential of nerve cells, doing something on the go. She tried to paint, to write poetry, and to meditate, but it just didn't seem to work out. And in the end, she decided that it was enough, perhaps just to live another day, and then another, and another, and another, pretending, above all, to herself, that it was as if nothing had happened. What Adriana didn't have was a lot of thinking about why this was happening to her. Why did she deserve this from the universe? She accepted what had happened simply as fact. Yes, it had happened. Yes, it was a nightmare. But it was all just a coincidence. Granddaughter, everything happens in life for a reason, her grandmother had once told her. Each event leads to another. That's how life works, like bids of pearls strung on a string. Adriana did not argue with what her grandmother said, because she felt sorry for her, as well as for her grandfather. She was well aware of how much her old people, as well as her mother and father, had suffered back then, how much they had disturbed her. So why cloud her life with arguments with her relatives? That was Adriana's reasoning. It was easier. It made her life easier. But not everything was so simple and smooth. Adriana hardly dared admit it to herself. But since that fateful day, it was as if there were shards of the darkness that Ethan had been infected with, that he had obeyed. It was just that Adriana realized one day that it had hardened. It happened already after graduation when she was 18 years old. She had just entered teacher's college then, and she had an affair with a handsome guy. And the affair, which is quite natural, at some point reached a very intimate stage of development. And that's when, in general, Adriana timidly said that she had one peculiarity, the guy said that it was nothing, that she was all beautiful to him. And then when he saw, I'm sorry, I apologized, he hastily pulls up his pants, I can't you're starting to look like a scarecrow. The second man with whom Adriana had almost reached intimacy at the sight of her scars reacted as if calmer, but asked her to please turn off the lights and told her not to touch her body in that area with her hands because he was squeamish and Adriana was just sick of it. She was just offended and suddenly realized that since men need a perfect girl, since they are not ready to accept a flaw like that, it means that she will have to be alone perhaps for the rest of her life. So be it. And then Adriana with one bow deliberately did so. She accepted his advances, brought everything to the peak of romance. And then, already knowing what to expect, demonstrated her peculiarity. The bow didn't fail. He was horrified and ran away. And Adriana in her imagination on men as a seal put the underpants. They only want to be ideal. And if that's the case, it's better to be alone. And in fact, 
It was the understanding of what effect the sight of her disfigured legs produces that pushed Adriana to so easily undress at the first request of the restaurant manager. After all, she knew for certain that neither he nor anyone else present would be pleased by the sight. The girl did it driven by a spontaneous outburst of emotion, and at first it seemed to her that everything was right. Well, then it became sickening, and so Adriana decided that she had had enough. It was time to return to the village and spend with her grandparents and parents left behind in the neighboring one. The money not earned was a pity, of course, but she had some money set aside. And then during the sessions, Adriana knew for sure she would have the opportunity to work part-time with a tutor for the guys from the younger courses. She was very good in Russian language, literature, and social studies. She believed that she would become a good teacher in the future. As soon as Adriana stepped on the land where her native villages stood, she felt better. The girl enjoyed breathing in the clean air, what is not in the city air and smiled. And for some reason it seemed that now everything would be fine. Only already approaching the village of Kalina, Michael thought about what he was doing. Suppose, he reasoned. Adriana had already told her family and friends what had happened. Then it was very likely that he would not be spoken to, he would be beaten. However, if, after a heart-to-heart, -heart, she agrees to listen to him, then he might be patient, and what other development is possible? The male Michael shuddered. He was shaken by the shoulder. The conductor is the ultimate. He was so absorbed in his thoughts that he did not notice that they had already arrived from the bus. Time to get off. Apologizing and thanking for the reminder, Michael got off the bus. He had gotten so nervous on the way that he hadn't even bothered looking for a hotel. And not that Michael was stalling, but he started poking at his smartphone right away. The answer was simply predictable. No, there was an inn in the villages of Kalina and Silence. So Michael assumed he would have to go to the district center, but as the bus might not show up again today, which meant in his mind, Michael noted, he'd have to call an intercity cab. It's always available, just pay. And basically, the day was already slipping toward evening so it would make more sense to go to the district center now and see Adriana fresh tomorrow. But ever since Michael had set foot on this land, the milk and Kalina had never left him. A strange, almost mystical feeling that he must not delay his visit. Yes, Dad, distracted, Michael from his thoughts on the incoming call parents. They promised to call because Michael's mom was very worried about how her son got there. And in fact, Michael, not to tell his parents the full version of what happened so far, committed a bad deed by his own moral standards. He told them that he just went to visit a former classmate in another city. Yes, already in place, everything is fine, said Michael, taking the first steps from the bus stop forgotten. The narrow road was off the main road and on both sides of it was densely overgrown with thistles, mugwort, and other weeds. I'm sorry, of course, but let's not do it now. Michael rolled his eyes, because it seemed that his father was going to give him a new portion of tales from his professional life. Michael froze in the next moments, because he heard a painfully familiar name. The father was passing on a fresh and acute news from the world of psychiatry. It turned out that Ethan Marlowe of the very same Ethan Marlowe, who had been declared insane a few years ago, was now suddenly having an exacerbation. It seems that his relatives had oversight and he had quit taking the pills he was supposed to take regularly and for the rest of his life, even after he was discharged from the clinic. And now Ethan was being searched for, because before he disappeared two days ago, he had painted all the walls, ceiling, and even the sheets on the bed in his room with dark shades of markers. Ethan was painting gold stripes with the talent of a madman. It's my fault. I was against letting him go home. I'd rather he was in the clinic. I mean, he's unpredictable. I don't know where he is right now, Father Michael muttered. Michael stopped, closed his eyes, and rubbed his nose tiredly. This is just awful. What are we going to do now? Well, the relatives are standing on their ears, trying to figure out what could have been on his mind. I mean, he barely spoke, but the last few days, he kept repeating himself. 
He kept saying he had to finish. But what did he want to finish? Father Michael exclaimed. Michael sighed convulsively. This was the only problem he needed to deal with. And he also thought about the fact that Adriana, she certainly had a right and a need to know that this terrible man was now on the loose. And Michael jumped at the realization that was occurring to him. He seemed to have just realized what he was talking to a madwoman about. A self-proclaimed priest of the Golden Band. The dairy village of Kalina. He might be here to finish something. Think for yourself, Dad, what he has left unfinished business, Adriana girl. He, yeah, I'd swear he wants to do what he was prevented from doing. Somebody always has to get here as soon as possible. In the meantime, I'll warn Adriana. Michael took a step further. Yes, he was terribly guilty. Adriana might be angry with him, but she would have to listen to him because she was in great danger. And Michael wanted to believe that he would not be late. He felt as if he'd been banging on the gate for ages, but in fact it was only a few minutes before they were opened. Evening. Good evening. Good evening. A certain old woman said hello, appraising him with a wary look. Electrician. No, Michael waved his head. I need to speak to Adriana. It's urgent. My granddaughter needs me. What is it about? The old woman wished thoughtfully with her lips on a personal matter. Tell me, please, Adriana, who is Bush at home? Landlady. Someone looked out of the house, an old man in a calfskin jacket. Michael realized that he wouldn't get a quick answer, but he didn't want to scare Adriana's elderly relatives, who had already lived through a nightmare in fear for her. Please, I need to talk to her right away. Hi. A young girl stood at the fence of a neighboring house. Looked like she'd just gotten back from a magic shop. She had a bag of groceries in her hand. You, Adriana, need some. So she went into the woods, waving the girl's free hand toward the right direction. She goes there a lot. Today on mushrooms only something was presented, added the neighbor. And with a tinge of excitement in her voice, Michael went cold. Only not that pierced the thought that Adriana is by the will of an evil fate, itself deliberately goes into the claws of a predator. Or else he was exaggerating, and Ethan was still far away, and anything bad that might happen could be prevented. But Michael realized something else right now. There could be no more delay and no more hiding. And so he turned to Christina and said firmly, I must warn you, Ethan Marlowe is after Adriana. Christina gasped, pressed her palm to her mouth. Granddaughter, we need to find her as soon as possible, Michael said. What are you talking about? A young neighbor rounded her eyes. Isn't he in a mental institution? Not anymore. Michael shook his head. I'm afraid he might already be here. And that's why we really have to hurry. Someone had once told Adriana that after what had happened, fear would live in her heart forever. Not so. She still loved to walk in the woods of the river. Sometimes she'd go as far as the bogs in the cranberry steam. She had learned to breathe freely, not to squint at her own shadow, not to flinch at every rustle. The past belonged to the past, Adriana reasoned. Now she had to live in the present. Her hand was nicely pulled away, and the basket full of different mushrooms in her head was a lazy dot of bees swirling thoughts. Yes, perhaps she had been a little overzealous when she'd flashed her bare legs and hips in front of so many people. However, since they were not strangers, in fact, strangers, they had probably forgotten about it. Adriana gave herself a mental kick and a slap on the wrist, reminding herself that now they should worry about other things, like how to successfully pass the session, where to get a new job, or rather a part-time job in the fall and winter. And then in that instant, when a man from her past suddenly appeared in front of her. Adriana didn't even immediately believe her eyes. She just stared at Ethan Marlowe, wide-eyed with a wide-open voice. Was it possible for him to appear to her? Or, more accurately, after her, and in almost the exact same spot? Lips. The girls trembled, but no sound came out of them. I'm paralyzed with fear, Adriana thought. And then apparently to keep from breaking down. Her consciousness planted a joke in her mind. Just one day, a psychiatrist who counseled her, after all, 
had told her that she needed to work up the courage to face her fears. Face them. Oh well, Adriana thought. That seemed to be what was happening to her now. And then everything was happening too fast. Ethan's face had aged more outwardly than it really was. Years past distorted Simon threw himself at her. A basket of mushrooms fell. Adriana threw herself to run, but it was as if the forest was now against her. A dry snag fell under her foot. She got tangled up and fell. Here we meet. Sailed with anger, Ethan said. Yes, of course, I'm expecting you. That's all right. I've got my reward streak all to myself now. Adriana Barnacles. Wiggle stabbed and bit and resisted as best she could. But Ethan even out, apparently, and by his mental ailment, that weakened and his body was still much stronger. And then, after a few minutes of fiddling, when he had had enough of it all, he just struck Adriana hard several times on her face and head, and she lost her senses. The setting sun near the cinders of the mountain's edge. After the food, ruby gold rays were in Adriana's eyes as she slowly began to come to her senses. The girl coughed. Contributions of kin permeated the strange, as if full of honey and bitter meadow grasses. D. There was slashing and low breathing in her ears. What? What are you doing? Whispered. She tried to move, but not her arms, not her legs wouldn't obey. Ethan had not bound her, but she was completely helpless, could essentially only watch while he could act. His face was covered with rags, and Adriana guessed he was protecting her from the strange stupefaction of the beggar's smoke. He moved closer to her, and Adriana wanted to scream, but all that came out of her throat was a squeak no stronger than a mouse could squeak. Her mind was filled with thoughts and images. How similar everything was to what she had already experienced. At the same time, it was different. Details of Kathy's grandmother and sister's story surfaced in her mind. When her madman wanted to give her as a bride to the master of the mountain. There was a fire there too. And there was smoke. He must come, bring Ethan's voice to her. The man was held then at six and distressed by a coarse shiver. Peered into the pendant at Harry's side behind which appeared black gaffs. Either shadows lay among the piled stones, or they were passages in the cave, and Adriana didn't know for sure. Harry was a local boy, and he wanted adventure. They didn't want to be unkind to this place. Master of Mount Palace, come out. Ethan howled in a voice full of despair. He cried out to the legendary monster, begging him to help him regain his wealth, respect, and power. And in return, he begged for the gift of a young, beautiful girl. How long did it take? It must have been a long time. Because the sun had almost had time to set, and now only the lights from the Kievan of Light shone over the mountain. He can't hear you, Adriana said. She laughed nervously. How pathetic are you? You think that if he exists, he will condescend to someone like you. You're crazy. Well, that was definitely unnecessary. Only Adriana realized too late that she had ruined the madman, when he had already flung himself at her with his neck bowed low, sputtering saliva and hissing hoarsely. He accused Adriana of being some kind of wrong maiden, and if she was crawling squeamishly. Nothing. Nothing. I guess the Lord of the Foothills doesn't want to come after you alive. Well, then, I'll send you to him. When Ethan's hand swept the girl on the ground, clutching something sharp, glittering steel, there was nothing she could have done and managed to turn away, to avoid the fatal blow. But at the same instant those from the forest rushed toward them, and the next instant the two men were rolling on the ground in a furious fight. Julia recognized Michael, and at first she thought she thought it was just her imagination why he would show up here to help her, but it all seemed real. The men were striking each other. One or the other would suddenly find himself closer to what his opponent had been subjected to. And then, the media hissed and the grass rustled. That's what caught the attention of all three of them. They turned their heads and Adriana's eyes rounded because there, in the shadows of the woods behind a shroud of smoke from the campfire that made her head spin and as if sleep had taken over, she suddenly saw what appeared to her to be the figure of a man. 
He was tall of black hair and was in black gold, and his eyes were the eyes of a snake. You don't exist, whispered Adriana. I have come, whispered Evan. My master howled madly. Michael said nothing. His mind was now racing with a single thought. Had he gone mad? The figure of the golden floor, appearing as if from an ancient fairy tale, suddenly raised his hand, long fingers with sharp claws, at first pointing at the girl, but then shifted. And now they were pointing exactly at Ethan. I was confused, the madman said. You're coming at me. But why? I'm doing everything you want me to do. Michael already seemed that the arms of the band remained motionless, but the expression on his face changed. It was distorted with anger and contempt. Michael was so glad that what could not exist in the world by all the laws of nature was not angry at him. And then Ethan suddenly wheezed and clutched at his heart. Everything happened fast. Here he was just now pinning Michael to the ground, giving him a crushing blow. Here he is himself defeated, seemingly not even breathing anymore. Adriana. Michael pushed his heavy body down, staggered, stammering toward the girl. He coughed from the smoke. Adriana, we need to get away. Fresh air, falling for it, Adriana whispered. No, he's gone. Michael rushed to keep looking in that direction, but with his side vision, he could see a tall, dark figure. We're imagining it. He doesn't exist. He, he won't collect me, whispered Adriana again. Was she close to fainting? Of course he wouldn't, and I'm not giving you to anyone. Do you hear me? Come on, come on, get up. Sorry, I can't carry her. We need some fresh air. Let's get out of here. Adriana finally gave in to the entreaties and with a quiet and pitiful tone, grabbed him by the shoulders and managed to stand up. He was gone. Polos. He was gone, she said. He was gone, Michael said. Look, look, Adriana held Michael's hand stubbornly and he gave in to her and looked where he had seen something that could not exist in the real world a few minutes earlier. The figure of the vine was no longer there, but it was in the grass. Michael saw it clearly. Some kind of large snake was crawling. An eel, viper, whatever. But it was enough for Michael's frozen mind to organize and logically explain what he saw. He decided that because of the smoke, which could have been poisonous plants, he had seen Harry's fairy tale host. It was just that he had seen an ordinary snake in reality. The realization from behind the smoke of fear for Adriana in the fight drew the rest. That's all. Everything has another explanation. He repeated to himself logically. Soon Michael and Adriana were found by people who rushed to rescue the girl. Just Michael, when they entered the forest, missed them. He turned aside guided by some strange premonition that this was the right way. Michael and Adriana did not yet know that this event would be the starting point after which their lives would change forever. Intertwined. Michael apologized to Adriana. She managed to forgive him with all her soul. Ethan, by the way, turned out to be alive, but two days later he passed away in the clinic and to the last he felt that the golden polos was angry with him. It's all over now, Christina said with confidence when she learned of Ethan's death. Adriana's grandmother also said she could feel it in her heart. No more madwoman will be found who can believe in tales of the golden voice. But the story with the master of the mountain magically got an unexpected continuation. The thing was that when Adriana was returning home, she found a pebble in her sneakers. A common occurrence. Sure, if you get sap in your shoe. Only it was a small green pebble in a sparkling shard of glass. I think it's an emerald. Grandma said knowingly. What shall we do? We'll have a granddaughter. I don't need it. Adriana shrugged. And that same day, going to the river, threw it into the water. It was a piece of glass, she said when she got home. And Christina pretended to believe it. Adriana, despite the excitement and even the renewed media attention, still went to the city for a session. Then she graduated. And immediately after graduation, the girl married Michael, with whom she had an affair a long time ago. As she now knew back in the day when he saved her from the crazy Ethan, 
and maybe from the golden canvas itself. Subscribe and click the bell. And she was invited for an interview. Julia was nervous the day before. She wanted the job. Julia needed it like air. It was a chance to get out of a financial hole, to stay afloat. Where else to find such a salary? That's why the girl was worried, worried about what if she was not taken. What then again to look for a place waitress? Labor for pennies. Cab brought Julia to the country cottage village. Elite neighborhood high, beautiful houses surrounded by fences. At the gate the girl met a woman, an au pair. As Julia found out later, and in fact a person who had everything on her plate. Cleaning, cooking, laundry. Because her employer William was always too busy. Businessmen in general have very little free time. William met the job applicants in the living room. He was a man in his 40s with intelligent, piercing blue eyes. Perfectly styled hair with a slight square. An athletic figure. Yes, this man clearly paid attention to health and appearance. Juliet even cracked up at first. How to start a conversation with someone like this? To herself next to him, she suddenly seemed insignificant. Good morning. Warm. William smiled, and Julia's embarrassment vanished. The man's smile was open, and the kind William seemed at once like a man of his own. Hello. Julia smiled back. I'm here through an ad for you. It's very good. I'll tell you right away. I need a nurse for my daughter Sophia. She is in a very serious condition now, so it's not for everyone. She's being monitored by the paramedics. They're here every day. I could hire a nurse for Sophia, but how can I tell you? There's already a lot of pain in her life, a lot of people in white coats. I wish there was someone else there for her. You know, a young girl like you, cheerful, who knows a lot of songs and fairy tales, who can cheer up a child, inspire him, come up with some interesting activity, in general, to brighten up her leisure time. Why? What's wrong with your girl? Julia just couldn't help but ask that question. Who would know? William lowered his eyes. His face grew darker in an instant, becoming anxious and tense. Sophia, it's been examined everywhere. No one could understand anything. It's like her body is destroying itself. No signs of autoimmune aggression. She's been getting tests all the time. They do, but she's fading and nothing helps her. Poor baby, Julia exclaimed. The doctors are doing what they can. I have the means, as you can see. But they are not all powerful, unfortunately. Anyway, Sophia needs more than just a nanny. We have Adriana, our favorite au pair. She will feed her, give her medications on time, and we don't just need a caregiver either. Sophia is supervised by nurses, they do all the necessary procedures. Sophia is needed soon. A friend, a person who can bring her positive emotions. The doctors say it's very important in her condition. And looking at you, it seems to me that you're young, beautiful, cheerful, and you have a kind look in your eye. You can empathize. That's good. Julia nodded. She wanted to see Sophia as soon as possible. If she needed positive emotions, she would provide them. Julia was sure to cheer up a girl who had such a serious illness. To brighten up the gray, everyday life of the little patient will find a way to make her life more pleasant. If you're ready to get to work right now, William continued, let's start a trial period. Let's say three days, and then Sophia will decide. Of course, you will be paid for your time anyway. But do you agree? Yes, nodded Julia. Good, William asked. Then Adriana will introduce you to Sophia. And I'm off. Business. As the door shut behind William, Adriana, a middle-aged woman with a surprisingly soft and cozy look, turned to Julia with a question. I used to talk to babies. Do you know what little kids are like? I have nephews, Julia nodded. Is that a good thing? Adriana shook her head. But Sophia is ours, she's an unusual child. I've already realized that. I guess Sophia hardly ever gets out of bed, she gets tired quickly. It's hard to get her interested in anything, but you have to. Sophia needs to be distracted from her pain, from her agony. And she needs to walk at least an hour a day. That's what the doctor said. I get it. Well, now let's go meet her. Julia followed Adriana up to the second floor and entered the nursery. 
It was a spacious princess room. A huge window let in a lot of daylight. Along the walls were racks of expensive toys and books. Right in the center of the room was a mini playground. There was a slide, swings, and even a trampoline. A little farther away was a ball pool, and closer to the door was a bed. What kind of bed was it? A big, round one. Julia looked around curiously. She had never seen a room like this before. Was it all for one child? In the midst of this splendor Julia did not immediately notice the little mistress of the room. The girl was lying in bed surrounded by large stuffed toys. There was a cat baton, a fluffy white bear, a bright green crocodile with flowers all over his body, and a skinny pale seven-year-old girl, completely transparent and almost merged from the unhealthy color of her skin with the white bed linen. Huge blue eyes, like her father's, looked at the entrance with curiosity. Sophia raised herself up on her elbows, though it cost her great effort, and turned to Adriana. Who's that with you? The new rehabilitator. The difficult word came out of the little girl's mouth easily and habitually, and it felt unnatural. No, Bunny, this is your new friend. Her name is Julia. Will you play dolls together? Sophia got a little excited. Would you like to? I smiled at Julia. The girl evoked sympathy and pity. I like to play dolls very much. That's good. Adriana's not available. Can't daddy play at all? Adults have a lot to do, Julia shrugged. That's why they can be boring sometimes, Sophia suggested. And the conspirators smiled. Boring, agreed Julia. Sophia laughed quietly. Well, I can see you're going to be fine. Adriana looked genuinely happy. Did you have fun here? I'm going to make dinner. Oh, and Sophia, you remember the nurse is coming to see you today, right? I remember, the girl frowned. Again, IVs. But where to go? Sweet Adriana kissed the top of the girl's head and left the room. Julia was left alone with Sophia. Well, shall we play? The girl turned to her ward with a smile. You have so many beautiful toys here. I can't keep my eyes open. You'd better read to me, the girl asked. It seemed that the short conversation had taken the last of her strength. Sophia sank down on the pillows, hold the blanket over her skinny body, although the room was warm. Good, Julia agreed. She was surprised and horrified by the weakness of this child of seven. They are also Azers, such as Larry, Julia's older nephew, he is just the same age as Sophia. But he can't even sit still for five minutes. He's always getting into things, figuring things out. If the boy was suddenly in this room, he would immediately start jumping on the trampoline or going down the slide. Helen calls him the perpetual motion machine and Molly. Christina and Christina are not lagging behind her brother, although they are younger. Sophia is lying there, poor thing. What do you want to read about princesses? There's a book on the windowsill. Vera started to read it to me, but she doesn't have time to read it. It was a heavy, beautiful book with bright pictures. But the story itself, it seemed Julia some kind of silly, boring, predictable, and formulaic. She herself, as a child, did not like such stories at all. And let's make up our own story about these princesses. As Julia I expected tired eyes Sophia flashed interest. How to do it, she clarified. Very simple. I start, you continue. Sophia was engrossed in the lesson. She was inspired to invent adventures for the princess. She would ride in her racing car. Then the heroine would be kidnapped by a dragon and then rescued by the prince. The girl's imagination was running wild, which seemed to surprise Sophia herself. Then Adriana entered the room. Seeing that Julia and Sophia were getting along, she was pleased. The woman brought a lunch of mashed soup and stewed vegetables. Sophia grumbled. I don't want it, she said. I don't want to eat at all. I don't want any of this. Adriana looked at Julia. The woman was clearly waiting for her help. Let me feed you. Julia turned to Sophia. Each spoonful. Another princess adventure. I'll make them up as I go along. Can you imagine the stories I'll have to tell you? What do you think will finish your food or my fantasy first? It worked. The food ended faster than Julia's fantasy. But Sophia demanded more story. Adriana splayed out her hands in surprise, smiled and walked out. Soon a nurse, Sophia, entered the nursery. Immediately on the gloomy one. She was almost asleep by now. 
Lunch and the story had tired her out. But it was time for treatments. IVs. Hopelessly asked the girl to the nurse. She nodded sympathetically. I'll do it quickly. Don't worry, it won't hurt. You sleep later, and we'll have tea. Adriana pulled Julia by the sleeve. Aren't you needed here now? The au pair led Julia into the spacious kitchen, smoking cups of coffee and a flavorful cake that looked like it had just come out of the oven were waiting on the table. You, Sophia, and I see you're getting along. The woman smiled, looking warmly at Julia. That's good. Sophia had kicked out the previous nanny, but he's taken to you right away. I've already called William and told him all about it. He's very pleased and excited. He told me to take good care of you. I'm glad too. Julia smiled. Sophia is just a pity. My nephews are so noisy, so cheerful. She is lying on the bed, she can't even play, she has nothing to play with. It's scary. That's what the doctors say, there's a chance. No prognosis, Adriana shook her head. They can't even diagnose anything. They just treat the symptoms, that's all. Sophia will be better now after the drip. Take her for a walk after her afternoon nap for a while. William, the girl's father. I get that. Where's her mom? On a business trip. She has a demanding job too, that's why she can't babysit. I wish, Adriana sighed. Is Betty ours? She's gone. It was a difficult labor. The doctors tried to save the baby and didn't notice that the mother needed help. And she herself, Helen, didn't complain to them about anything. She was worried about the baby. But that's how it turned out. The day after the birth, Betty had a high fever. Checkup, ICU, this and that. Her heart stopped. Poor thing had some kind of internal bleeding. It's a rare case. And then there was Sophia in the NICU. She was born prematurely. It was a tough time. That's a shame. That's a shame, Adriana agreed. Let me tell you the whole story. Looks like you're gonna be here for a while. So you should know. William grew up in a well-to-do, close-knit family. A loving mom and dad, caring, attentive grandparents, a room of his own. Trips to the seaside every summer, birthdays, friends. William had a happy childhood, an equally happy youth. He graduated from high school with a gold medal. Thanks in large part to parents who cared about their son's education. If they saw gaps, they immediately hired William the best tutors and foreign languages and the boy studied in foreign camps and rest and education at once. Vouchers to such places were not cheap and it was not easy to get them. But what can't you do for the sake of your favorite son, especially if he is so desirable and long awaited? William had rather old parents. They did not get a child for many years. The couple resigned, was with such a fate. But then, when there was no hope left, life suddenly threw a surprise gave the couple an heir. Needless to say, all of his mother's and father's attention from then on belonged undividedly to William. William was never shy of his parents. Yes, he saw his mother and father much older than the relatives of his classmates. But the boy, on the contrary, was proud of them because William's father was a well-known businessman in the city, and his mother was the head doctor of the regional hospital. Everyone knew them, everyone respected them. It never occurred to William to be ashamed of his family. William grew up. His parents were rapidly becoming obsolete, giving up. When the guy was in his third year of university, his father died. Stroke, intensive care, coma, and all. William then for the first time felt like an adult, you bet, because he, a student, had to get into the affairs of the company, which his parents left the guy by inheritance. It was William, a teenager, who was interested in his father's business. He knew a lot, even had the right to sign. And yet still at first, he entrusted most of the processes to the manager of the board, a longtime friend of his departed parent. Because William needed to study and support his mother, who had given up a lot after the death of her spouse. Three years passed. William had just gotten his degree, just taken over his father's company. Just starting to gain momentum. And then there's another blow. Mom this time. The kid was all alone. William felt miserable and lonely in his parents' big house. At least Adriana, the au pair and almost a member of the family, was there. She had known William as a baby and treated him as her son. 
the woman had no children of her own. She gave all her care to the young man, who had lost both his parents one after the other. It was hard on him, Adriana shook her head. Just a boy, but also. Work had pulled him through then. He had to decide something, to go somewhere, to hold meetings, to make contracts, and so on. That's what saved him back then. Time passed. William went from a young, inexperienced guy to a smart guy. A grip on the man, a talented businessman. Adriana rejoiced, looking at her ward. He grew older, stronger, more confident. The au pair wanted William to find a good wife, marry her, and become a father. Then her heart would be at peace. Adriana was calm. Only he had no one in particular. Adriana said. No, there were some girls hanging around William. He's a good-looking guy, wealthy. They're always on the prowl. But I met with one of them, and I didn't see anything wrong with the other, I didn't like them as counselors. And I didn't like them either. It seemed like they only wanted money from him. He's got a tail on his head. And then, then Betty showed up. William met Betty literally on the street. She was walking down the sidewalk in a hurry. Turns out she was going to a job interview at William's firm. Betty had recently been downsized. The factory where she had worked for several years, after the institute as an accountant, had suddenly closed. So Betty was looking for a new position, and William went out for a walk to clear his head. He even had a goal to buy donuts at the bakery around the corner. And that's when fate knocked the young people head on literally. Helen jumped out of the corner too quickly and ran into the unsuspecting William. It was like something out of a romantic music video. The bag slipped off Betty's shoulder and the contents scattered on the pavement. William and Betty rushed to pick it up. Did the girl harbor words of apology? William assured her it was okay and admired the girl's beautiful gray eyes. It was love at first sight. When the young people sorted out the bag and the things that had spilled out of it, they rose synchronously and smiled at each other. Well, William, as a man, made the first step learn the name of the beautiful stranger and then introduced himself. They walked leisurely and talked and got acquainted. When William found out that Betty was rushing to his office, he asked and immediately realized that this beautiful girl was his destiny. And it was not by chance that they met in such an interesting way, rather than seeing each other for the first time in the office. It was more romantic, more interesting, more enjoyable. All in all, a real romance was brewing. Adriana had never seen William so happy. Betty turned out to be intelligent, understanding, kind. She and Adriana, and importantly, quickly found a common language. Sweet, sweet girl. And for what? And only such a fate. Sadly shook her head Adriana. A couple of years after their acquaintance William and Betty got married. It was a wonderful couple, harmonious, happy. There was love, mutual understanding and respect between the couple. I am sure that her heart rejoiced when she saw them together her beloved. After all, Vanya, his wonderful, beautiful wife. Here with children both decided not to hurry. Adriana continued the story. It was their common decision, as if they felt something. They traveled, worked, met with friends. And I, the fool, all in the old man's way. I advised them not to wait too long. I wanted to nurse their baby. But William and Betty lived on their own for five years after they were married. Were they happy together? No, they wanted kids, but not right away later while they were happy with everything. And then the news of Betty's pregnancy. It was an unplanned event, but the whole household welcomed it with joy. Well, then it was time, Betty summarized. The baby had decided he'd had enough of waiting. Thank God. Adriana threw up her hands. I think you're having a boy. You're very beautiful, Betty. Girls take away their mother's beauty during pregnancy. But the au pair was wrong. The ultrasound confirmed that Betty was expecting a girl. A big, strong one. They showed me a picture of her. They take pictures of a baby in the womb now. And when I looked at it, it looked just like Betty. That's how our Sophia was born, just like her mommy. Sophia. It was Betty who chose the name for her daughter. William and Adriana didn't mind. They both liked it very much. The pregnancy didn't go too easily. At first, Betty was suffering from toxicosis. Then it seemed to subside. 
but it was replaced by other problems such as high blood pressure and swelling. The child was developing well, but the mother was suffering, melting before her eyes, refusing to eat, lying down a lot. The usually energetic Betty lacked the strength even to go downstairs. Adriana carried her food directly to her bedroom. The woman felt sorry for Betty, helped her in any way she could, and assured her that everything would go away after her daughter was born. Children aren't easy for women, Adriana sighed. Pregnancy had taken its toll on Betty. Who's to say? Julia shrugged, remembering her sister. Both of them had gotten babies relatively easily. Anyway, Betty went into labor much earlier than she should have. The whole pregnancy was threatened, so fortunately, the mother-to-be was in the hospital under the supervision of doctors at that moment. They tried to stop the process, but failed. Sophia was born prematurely. Weak she did not scream. She was not placed on Alina's chest, not even shown to her. When it comes to newborns who need to stay in the womb for at least three more months, things are different. Sophia was immediately sent to the intensive care unit. The fight for her life began. And Betty and Lena seemed to be fine at first. Well, tired, of course, after childbirth. Well, anxious. She couldn't find a place for her daughter. It's all understandable, all explainable, and natural. The doctors examined the woman in labor, found no abnormalities, and sent her to the ward. Afterwards, serious symptoms appeared, but it was too late. William and I were all worried about the girl. Adriana almost cried. It was obvious that even now, seven years later, it was hard for her to remember it all. They thought that the little girl would not survive, she was born too early, she was very weak. And then, when William received a call from the hospital in the morning and was told that his wife had died of internal bleeding, he could not believe his ears. It seemed to him that it was Sophia. His mind refused to accept what he was hearing. But no, Sophia had made it. Stronger was the girl. Betty, on the other hand, was not. William, then the gray one walked around, didn't sleep or eat for months. I thought he was going to die too, but he went away. I had to work, I had to pull Sotnikova through. To be perfectly honest, he didn't treat his daughter well at first. Blamed her for what happened to Lena. He knew it was wrong. But he couldn't help it, he was angry with her, that's all. Sophia was discharged home. They hired a nanny for her. Someone had to look after the baby. Adriana was too old for that, but she enjoyed playing. Sophia took her around the yard in her stroller and talked to her a lot. And she was the only one who gave the newborn the love she needed. My father was not capable of that at that time. She is like a granddaughter to me, smiled the au pair. I accepted her immediately. But William he long shunned the child bought for her everything necessary, and sometimes went for a walk with her. And that was if I made him. He didn't take the initiative himself. And then one day Sophia got sick, the temperature was high, nothing helped, she was throwing up, it was the flu. It plagued a lot of people back then, and the little ones took it especially hard. But anyway, Sophia went to the hospital again. The doctors didn't give any prognosis. And that's when William came to his senses, gave up everything. He sat by his daughter's bedside singing songs and singing, telling poems, rocking her in his arms, and Sophia. It was as if she felt her father's care. She was on the mend immediately. Our little girl was discharged and William became a real father, loving and caring. Life went on as usual. William worked a lot, but always found time to spend with his daughter. Sophia grew up, pleased her father and Adriana with her excellent health and rare intelligence. And everything seemed to be fine. But Adriana was worried that William was all alone. It seemed to her that there would be no happiness for him until he met a woman. Only now it was a very difficult task. Chosen by William, she had to love and accept Sophia. Otherwise a union was out of the question. Well, God heard my prayers, Adriana smiled. And William had Lucy, the beautiful Lucy. I can't take my eyes off her. She's smart too. She's got a baby herself, a little girl a little younger than Sophia. It's a great family. Lucy got a job with William, and it all started at a corporate party. So, it's the usual story. Lucy was very good to Sophia. 
she often took her and her youngest daughter somewhere to an amusement park or to the movies. Sophia loved both Lucy and her little half-sister Nancy. She was truly happy. William and Lucy got married and started living together. Then Sophia started having these symptoms. First dizziness, then nausea, weakness, lack of appetite. Examination in the best clinics, trips to doctors abroad, consultations with famous professors, all this did not give any result. Doctors could not diagnose the girl was melting before their eyes. The first year she was still on her feet. Adriana almost cried again. It was obvious that her heart was truly hurting for the little girl. After New Year's Eve she had gotten very ill, and now she was so afraid for her. And it is not clear what kind of illness attacked our little girl. Lucy and her daughter temporarily moved into her own apartment. Just Nancy went to the garden to carry infections from there, and for Sophia all this was extremely dangerous. So Lucy and William made that decision. And it comes from Lucy a lot, every day almost. She's good, Sophia is fair. They bring her goodies. They bring Nancy too, sometimes, when she's not sick. When she started kindergarten it started. Sick day after sick day, so they have a wife with one child separately, and a husband with their eldest daughter separately. That's the family. Well, what can I do? That's the situation. It's a strange situation, Julia said. She was shocked by the story of William and Sophia. You could make a TV series. Well, that's just the way it is. The old woman waved her hands. Sophia, I can see that you get along, and that's good. Everything will be more pleasant with you. The days went by. Julia now lived in the room next to Sophia's nursery. But the girl often asked the nanny to stay overnight in her bedroom. Sophia had a very comfortable sofa there. Julia lay down on it. They talked before going to bed, holding hands. Julia saw Sophia. It was very important. The girl clearly lacked attention, even though there were many adults around her. William was a very caring and anxious father and a pleasant person to be around. They often had conversations about Sophia. The man always listened attentively to Julia, did not interrupt or argue, and asked the right questions. Julia also got to know Lucy. Adriana was right. Indeed, she was a very beautiful woman. Chiseled cheekbones, beautifully curved lips, the grace of a panther, a real queen. But when Lucy interacted with Sophia, when she was adjusting the blanket on the girl, she smiled and stroked the little girl's head. Julia couldn't shake the feeling that the woman was faking it. It was evident in seemingly insignificant details. The cold glint of her eyes, the squeamish movement of her lips, something elusive and very unpleasant. One day Julia had a strange dream. The girl found herself in some room stripped wallpaper, creaking, twigs, floors. She sat on a stool by a dark window, through which nothing was visible, and realized that she was asleep. She wanted to wake up, but for some reason she couldn't. And then Julia did not even realize where she had come from. Betty appeared in front of her as if out of thin air. Julia recognized her because she had seen Sophia's mother in pictures. Betty smiled sadly and looked at Julia with a warm and very soft gaze. Watch her, she said in a quiet, illogical voice. Watch out for Lucy, she's trouble, she's dangerous. Betty vanished into thin air, and Julia had so many questions she wanted to ask her. How to keep an eye on her on what? What is she dangerous? Julia woke up in a cold sweat. Or rather, as if she'd flown into her body, fallen into it. It felt strange. Betty's words were still echoing in her head. No, Julia didn't believe in the supernatural. But the dream, which was little more than a dream, was more like a journey through time and worlds. The strange dream wouldn't let go. The next day Lucy was gone, and Julia waited for her. She knew for a fact that this woman was involved in something bad. Lucy is somehow hurting this family and doesn't like Sophia. She doesn't sympathize with the girl. She just pretends to care. And how come the others don't notice this, even the experienced, long-lived Adriana? Lucy showed up the next day, beautiful as always, brightly made up languid. First thing she did was go up to Sophia to say hello. Then she went down to the kitchen. Sophia is thirsty, Lucy said, looking at Adriana. Let me make her some cocoa. 
Come on, I fussed, the au pair. No, I can manage. I feel like it. I want to do something for her. You're so thoughtful. Julia was silent. She was watching Lucy like Betty had asked her to in the dream. For some reason it felt like this was the big moment. It was as if Betty was there, telling her to be vigilant. Adriana was tending to the dough. Julia pretended to look out the window. But she was watching Lucy. And then there was Tanya. The woman deftly pulled a small vial out of her sleeve, dripped a few drops from there into the milk, and immediately hid the bottle back. Only a couple seconds, a few deft movements, but Julia saw everything. The drink for the princess is ready. Lucy smiled. Julia, give me her favorite cup, please. Julia obeyed. She silently watched as Lucy poured what felt like a mug Sophia glasses, with the image of characters of the girl's favorite cartoon. And I realized Sophia shouldn't drink it. She shouldn't. She must act. Julia pretended to slip. She bumped into Lucy, who dropped the cup from her hands. The glass fell and shattered. What spilled out onto the floor? I'm sorry, I'm so clumsy. Julia fussed, grabbed a rag, started wiping, undoing the puddle, picking up the shards. It's okay, I'll do more. In the voice of Lucy sounded poorly concealed irritation. Julia could not do it a second time. It would arouse suspicion. So she had to accept the fact that Sophia would get the cocoa from her stepmother's hands. While Lucy and Adriana were at Sophia's place, Julia squeezed the rag she used to wipe the cocoa into an empty tomato paste jar. She was going to take the liquid to be analyzed today. I and needed to know exactly what Lucy put in the cocoa. Maybe it was just vitamins. Then there was no point in panicking. But something told the girl it wasn't. She had to wait two days for the test results. When Julia saw the statement, she was horrified. The drink contained a deadly poison, causing symptoms similar to those of Sophia. So the girl's weakness was due to her stepmother systematically poisoning her. Just like in a fairy tale, Julia didn't know who to turn to with her news. Adriana, what can she do? William, he wouldn't believe her. What to do? Lucy can't be allowed near the girl anymore. She wants to send her to the grave and she's almost succeeded. And yet Julia has the courage to talk to William. She told him everything about her terrible dream, about the cocoa, and about the examination. Julia was afraid that he would yell at her, call her out, kick her out, or what's more, accuse her of wanting to hurt his daughter. You know, William said, looking at Julia, I would. I'd probably fire you immediately after saying that. It's very strange, you have to admit. But just yesterday, I had an unusual dream too. Betty, she asked me to trust you just to trust you, nothing more. Why don't you just keep this to yourself and take a vacation? I need to sort this out. Adriana will call you when you can go back to work. Julia spent those few days on pins and needles. She didn't know what was going on at William's house and she was worried about Sophia, who had already become attached to her. But William had said to wait for the call, so she would wait. Adriana called Julia when she saw her name on the screen. Worried about what she would be told, how did it go? Come on over. All Adriana could do was extort. We're in the middle of something. Come over soon. Sophia misses you. Very much. Julia didn't have to beg long. Half an hour later she was already at William's house. The owner himself opened the door, still as calm and unruffled as ever. His appearance made it hard to guess what had happened. I want to thank you. The man finally allowed himself to smile. You were right. Lucy. She really wanted to. I'm afraid to say it out loud. Sophia wanted to poison that bastard. Adriana didn't bother. That's a lot to think about. I already trusted her. The story turned out to be banal, and old as the world stick. Lucy was not going to put up with a rival in the form of her wealthy husband's favorite daughter. She wanted her own daughter Nancy to be the sole heir to William's entire fortune. Well, first she herself, of course. Lucy had once studied to be a pharmacist. However, she never worked a day in her profession, preferring to live off rich admirers. Nature generously gave her beauty so that the opportunities for such an existence, the woman had. Received in college knowledge was enough to think of a way to send the hated stepdaughter to the other world. 
a poison and a poison that is difficult to detect in blood, tissue unless specifically looked for. Lucy poured the toxic substance into the food she cooked for Sophia. And the girl weakened, slowly fading away. There was nothing left to do. It doesn't make sense. Unbelievable. Everything Adriana couldn't calm down. Julia understood her. Indeed, Lucy's act was monstrous. How could she do that to a defenseless child? Sophia trusted her, loved her. So William installed surveillance cameras in the kitchen. It turned out that Lucy was putting poison in Sophia's food every time. Sometimes she cooked something for the girl herself, and sometimes she managed to drip from a vial into the food, probably cooked in it. I used my own hands to take it to Sophia, the poison. Anyway, Lucy was caught red-handed. She was now under investigation. Nancy had been taken by her father, a man who had wanted to communicate with the child for a long time, but was prevented from doing so because he was too poor to do so, too unworthy. Sophia, and everything will be fine, Adriana assured her. The child was not to blame for what his mother wanted to create. And Sophia, how is she? Sophia is fine. There was a ringing voice from behind her. Julia turned around and met Sophia's eyes. She was still very thin and pale, but she had the strength to walk around the house. A real miracle. The doctors said she would recover quickly. Julia. James walked slowly along the shelves of the children's store. It was a section for girls, so it seemed to both of them as if they were in the realm of pink and purple. Dolls, baby cosmetics, soft toys. It was mind-boggling. When I was in Europe, a guy bought his nephew a voice-activated robot. This is the thing. Maybe Sophia would like something like that. She's a girl, reminds me of Julia. And she definitely wants a cartoon character doll. We should try to find one. Maybe next birthday she won't want toys at all. Kids grow up so fast. It's amazing. We'll soon see for ourselves. James put his hand on Julia's rounded belly. The baby responded immediately with a still weak but tangible kick. A year ago, right after Sophia had been rescued from her evil stepmother, Julia had been in for another surprise. She continued to live close to Sophia. Sophia was recovering quickly, mastering active games, asking to take her for walks all over the city. The girl was still very attached to Julia, and that one still needed a job, and Julia had gotten used to everyone. To the girl Adriana, even William did not want to part with them. The adults initially decided not to tell Sophia the truth about what had happened to her. It was too scary a story. But the sensible girl managed to put two and two together, listened to something, thought of something. The story itself did not have a strong, destructive effect on her, as adults feared. Sophia took everything quite calmly. Everything is just like in fairy tales. The girl shrugged her shoulders. The little girl was coming back to life. In September, she went to school with her peers. And Julia was finally able to recover at the university, chose a correspondence department, because she had to not only study, but also work. However, her work was more like living in a family with her relatives. Sweet, cheerful Sophia. Kind, wise Vera Petrovna. Always busy, but polite and attentive William. With these people Julia was cozy, warm and comfortable. They took her in still and were very grateful to her for her rescue. Sophia. It is scary to think what could have happened if not for that terrible dream. They discussed this unusual event. First Betty had dreamed about Julia, then about William. Adriana was sure Betty had broken through time and worlds to save her daughter. William only shook his head and did not give his opinion. And Julia, she didn't know what to think. Perhaps Lucy had aroused her suspicions at once. After all, she had not liked Sophia's stepmother at first sight. More likely, Julia was running through the thoughts in her head. It is possible that they were transformed into unusual dreams. Except that William also dreamed Betty and asked him to believe. Julia found it more difficult to explain. That day, Julia left the house alone. Sophia was doing her homework. Adriana was doing chores around the house. Julia had to drive to the university to bring some documents to the dean's office. Suddenly, James stepped toward her. Julia couldn't believe her eyes from the Chantanou hair. And him? He looked happy and confused, smiling, 
looking at Julia as if there was no one more important to him in this world. At last I found you, he said, and without delay he pressed her against him. Julia did not understand anything, but she did not resist. She pressed against her lover, enjoyed his closeness, and tried not to think about James's betrayal, about his sudden disappearance. The explanation turned out to be ridiculously simple James simply dropped his phone into the ocean during a walk on a steamer. Naturally, the gadget disappeared irretrievably. Julia was not registered in social networks, so he simply could not contact her. No way, James wrote letters, like in the good old days of letters and telegrams. But Julia had moved in with William and was hardly ever home. So the letters piled up in the mailbox and then for some reason disappeared. Julia remembered this moment. One day she came home and saw that the mailbox door was broken. Someone had opened the box and taken the letters for some reason. Maybe the kids. Maybe. A nosy neighbor. In short, Julia hadn't heard from James, so she assumed he'd forgotten about her. Started a new life. Betrayed her. I couldn't just drop everything and leave. It was about my career and our future, our well-being. Without you, without news of you, it was unbearable. But I knew I would have to wait, and then financially I would be able to provide for us for many years to come. And then I could fly to you and explain everything. I had no idea. You're in some kind of dire straits. I didn't know you had to take out a loan. I didn't know you'd been laid off. It's been so hard on you. That's it. Just an unfortunate set of circumstances. Julia was glad that her feelings and James' feelings were real that there was no betrayal or deception in her life. Just a misunderstanding that had finally been resolved. James now had a contract with a well-known producer in the capital. He had everything he dreamed of concerts, gigs, tours, opportunities to take his music to people who were ready to accept it. And money, money of course. James was even able to buy an apartment for the two of them. It was in the middle of a renovation. James and Julia got married. They were already expecting a child. Julia felt happy and loved. She no longer worked for William. And a grown-up Sophia didn't need a 24-hour nanny to take care of her. But they all remained friends. And right now Julia and James were picking out a ninth birthday present for Sophia that might not have been. Julia decided at an early age, girls are either beautiful or smart. The girl knew very well she could choose, and she chose to be smart. The example of her older sister Helen was in front of her eyes. Everyone around her admired her beauty. Her hair was light blonde, silky clean, her eyes mermaid green, a figure they call model-like. Helen from an early age was focused only on her looks. She read a lot, but it was fashion magazines with advice on makeup, diet and so on. And Valen's girlfriends were exactly the same. Julia thought they were pretty, frivolous, fools. The mother, who lived alone two daughters, had high hopes for the eldest. If you marry Helen, we'll live happily ever after. Julia, then was still a very young girl, studied in the fourth or fifth grade. The girl was frankly perplexed. How can one put the responsibility for her happiness and well-being on some other person? Did the mother, who had been burned herself, not make the right conclusions? Once Julia asked her mother directly, you married your father for his money too. And he left us, went to a younger and prettier, even and left nothing to you or the children, because she had a good appetite. And now you teach the tape the same thing, so that it is the same. Splash, nodded mom. Helen is quite different from us. First of all, young, and secondly, she is much prettier than me. And she has me. It was me who had to come do everything myself. And I'll give you a hint and teach you everything. It will be good for you too, if you listen to me." Julia only sighed heavily. Her mother was beautiful, kind, but too frivolous. Both her mother and Helen lived with rose-colored glasses on their eyes. They all dreamed of a beautiful life. They believed that looks were the determining factor in a woman's success. But that's about it. Julia differed from her peers in her character, always being pragmatic, responsible, farsighted. And she clearly understood that to achieve something in this life, you have to work hard. And the options that her mother and older sister had in mind, the rich male benefactors, were all unreliable, fragile, illusory. 
Helen jokingly called her little sister a nerd. Her mother was always trying to remake Julia, to impose her point of view on her daughter. The most interesting parent sincerely believed that she wished her child well. I'm worried about your future. Well, how can you not understand? You're beautiful, we got such. You got the best of me and your father. When you finish school, we'll find you a wealthy fiancé. Just don't be like that. Men like cheerful and smiling. No, thanks. After school, I will go to study economics. Julia answered. Well, do you know what the competition is? Helen always started to argue at this point. You either have to be seven eyes in the head there, or you have to have a good deal. Yeah, mom sighed. We can't afford commercial education. And you can't get in for free. But Julia, trying not to listen to the arguments of her sister and mother, strived for her goal. Day and night she sat over textbooks, looked for additional courses on the internet, mostly free, because her mother, who worked as a cashier in the local supermarket, had no money for her daughter's education, and her father almost did not participate in the children's lives, as he had a new family. No, he still transferred some pennies, but everything was limited to that. No communication, no support or help in difficult situations. Julia knew from childhood that he could not be counted on. The girl deep down wanted at least once to meet and talk to her second parent. It seemed to her that perhaps the character she went just in him, because the mother and Helen Julia did not resemble at all. But he did not seek to meet his daughters, and Julia, she didn't want to impose. And it was scary to face indifference, or even worse, dislike of a native man. Her father was a businessman who owned a chain of stores. She had no time at all for student parties, going to clubs and other such entertainments. Sometimes, of course, she wanted to go out and have some fun. But the girl realized that every minute counted, her time was too precious. Besides, there was no money. Her mother tried to replenish her daughter's card with a small amount every month. Julia knew that it was a significant part of her parents' salary and was very grateful to her. It was not enough, very little. But still it was the help from her mother that allowed Julia to stay afloat. Especially after the third year when suddenly something in the university clinic changed and students were obliged to pay for the dormitory and before you could live there for free. Julia saved money on literally everything, but she didn't have time. She knew that she was going to her goal, which meant that sooner or later everything would be fine. Everything will be as she had dreamed. But on New Year's Eve, there was an event that made Julia reconsider her plans and turned her whole life upside down. It happened at that hectic time when before the New Year's students try to pass all credits in time to start the winter session after the holiday without debts. Julia was just preparing for a credit in economic history when she received a call from her sister. Helen's picture popped up on the screen. On it, the girl smiled widely and looked like a star. Julia immediately realized something was wrong. Helen would not call her at the third hour of the night. It's her. Julia is awake, studying for her exams. And her sister should be having her seventh dream by now. Mom's in trouble. Helen's voice rang through the phone. It seems that she was close to hysterics. Come over. What's wrong? Julia felt her limbs grow young and her stomach felt empty for some reason. Anxiety squeezed her heart ice cold, and a bus hit her with a rusty hand. What when she was alive? but it was impossible to get any intelligible answers from the Italian. She was already sobbing and sobbing into the tube, dropping only a few insignificant phrases. Mostly they were wails about how she was scared and bad now. As if the trouble happened in the evening, but Alina was informed only now, just a couple of minutes ago. And she immediately dialed her sister. Of course, there was no talk about any credits and exams at that moment. In the morning, Julia took the first flight home. She was almost the only passenger at the bus station at such an early hour. Julia found her sister in a terrible state, her hair shot up, her face swollen with tears. In her arms, she held her youngest daughter, a very young Molly. Helen was already a mother of many children. Her eldest son Larry, then two girls, Christina and Molly. None of the fathers were involved in raising the children. Princes, sons of rich parents refused to raise offspring and bathed in pennies with the elements. 
With Helen they were just having fun, with nothing serious in mind. And that one kept stepping on the same rake on purpose to get pregnant in the hope of finding a happy strong family. If something happens to her, how will I be alone with them? Helen looked at Julia with confused eyes, as if expecting her to offer a way out. But Julia, she was ready at this moment to hit her sister unbeknownst to her mother. And she only thinks of herself, how it happened. They had a corporate party, and Helen is machine carrying her daughter. Drunk, I guess. They told me mom was crossing the road in the wrong place. Jumped out in front of that bus. The driver couldn't do anything. He's in shock himself. He's kind of in the hospital now too. He had a heart attack right there on the spot. Bye bye. By the time we got there, I got a call late last night, and I called you right away. So mom's alive. Julia checked. That was the most important thing to her. What hospital is she in? Morozov's. Julia jumped out of the house and called a cab. He seemed to be making good money. But all his property was prudently written down to his new wife, so that his ex-wife and children would have no claim to anything. It looked ugly, petty, even mean. In theory, Julia should have been just as resentful of her father as her mother, just as Helen was. But Julia had a dream. To study economics, start her own business, and one day meet her father on a case. A joint project, a lucrative contract, something like that. Let him see what his daughter had accomplished on her own, without his help. And then maybe they can talk on equal footing. And Julia achieved her goal, she got into the faculty of economics, where she was so eager. How happy she was when she saw herself on the list of enrolled. Screamed right in front of the computer monitor, jumped from happiness to the ceiling. She went crazy. Helen came into the room with little Larry in her arms. She had recently become a mother and given birth to a son by a rich man. He paid child support, but he did not want to communicate with his mother and Larry himself. Needless to say, these alimonies were pennies. Standard scheme of great earnings, most of the income is hidden. Helen was just like her mother, even in an even worse version. But she was not going to give up and continue to dream of a prince, who will surely sooner or later solve all her financial problems. Her mother supported her eldest daughter in everything, adored her grandson. This is not surprising. Julia also gladly fiddled with the baby when she had time. But the girl did not understand how it was possible not to draw conclusions from what had happened. Wasn't it clear? The plan is not too good and often fails. It was time to choose another option. But no, Helen still hung out on dating sites, looking for bigger prey. I got in, Julia explained her strange behavior to her sister. Wow, cool. What, you're going to the city from us now? You're going away to study. Julia and her family also lived in the city but in a very small, remote from the regional center. Gray three-story houses, whole streets of old wooden barracks, a huge private sector. Julia's university was located there, and everyone called it that. Her mother, too, was happy to hear about her youngest daughter's enrollment. She had never hoped for such a thing. As it turned out, thought, let the little one, to show off. And when she realizes that nothing worked out, will go in the footsteps of her parents in the supermarket for the cash register. Well, and will think, finally, over the words of more experienced relatives. Realizes it is necessary to look for a rich and reliable man. And here's how it turned out. She did it. Good for you, daughter. Mom hugged Junior. I'll help you in any way I can. I'm sorry, I can't send you a lot of money, but at least a little for food, for housing, for being. Again, you need to dress nicely. In a big city, there's a better chance of meeting a decent man. Mom, you smiled at Julia again. She was touched by the fact that her mother supported and understood her, and even offered to help her. Julia knew. It's not easy for a mother to get that money, but she's willing to help her daughter while she's still a student. And that's priceless. Julia had a new life. She was given a room in the student dormitory, but not a separate one. The room had to be shared with two girls, but the roommates turned out to be very nice. They both studied at the Pedagogical Institute. Both, just like Julia herself, were focused on their studies and work. In general, the girls had a lot in common. With one of these neighbors, Valia, Julia even became friends. 
they kept their relationship even after they graduated from each of their universities and moved to rented apartments. Julia liked her studies. She was convinced in the first year that she had chosen the right direction. She found economics easy, the lectures seemed interesting, and term papers and tests were incredibly easy. Julia even started earning money. It turned out that people are willing to pay a lot of money for essays and projects. Big it is by Julia's standards, of course. The girl had to work part-time and study a lot. She needs to get there as soon as possible. She has to realize she's with a loved one. At the hospital, Julia was told the terrible news. Mom's gone. She had just recently passed away. At the moment when Julia rushed to the clinic, everything happened in the intensive care unit. The doctor then said that there was no chance of a good outcome. The injuries were too serious. And Julia would not have been able to say goodbye to her mother anyway. She was in a coma. And still the girl fed herself for slowness, for not supporting her mother by the hand. While she was still not, Julia was signing some papers when she received a call from Helen. She had been informed by someone on the nursing staff, and now the older sister was in a state of near panic. It had been a difficult time, arranging the funeral, trying to bring the sister who was supposed to take care of her babies no matter what, and the gradual realization of the terrible fact that the nearest and dearest person in the world was now gone. Just no, that's all. The father did not show up at the funeral, although he could not have been unaware of what had happened. This man did not even call his daughters, did not try to understand whether they need his help, probably thought they were adults. They were both over 18. So legally, the father was no longer their debtor. He paid child support until his daughters came of age, and there was nothing more to expect. It was then that Julia realized that she would not meet and communicate with this man, even when she reached the heights of her career, he didn't need Lenka and Mama, and they didn't need him either. No resentment. No. It's just that Julia suddenly realized that her father is a complete stranger to her. They may look alike in some ways, but he's a stranger, just a stranger. And that says it all. Helen, on the other hand, is a stranger, and she needs support. Helen cried nonstop for days. Julia didn't stop her, let her cry. It would make it easier for her. While her sister was dealing with her grief, Julia helped her with her nephews. The little ones made her smile even in such a terrible situation. It was impossible to look indifferently at their funny games, to listen to their cute babbling. Nephews, like nothing else, showed Julia life goes on. Julia could not stay long with her sister. Winter session. Helen had already recovered a bit and even started monitoring dating sites again. Now she wanted even more to have a supportive adult by her side. Her mom was gone. In spite of everything, Julia passed the session with honors. That meant an increased scholarship. This money would not even be enough to rent a room for a month. The dormitory became paid because it was necessary to eat, dress, and pay for transportation. Julia tried to combine her studies and work in the cafeteria. It turned out to be impossible at once a lot of passes and debts were accumulated. As a result, the girl did not even get admission to the next session. Expulsion loomed ahead. Teachers took into account the previous merits of the girl and went towards her. But she still failed. The only way out was the transfer to the correspondence department. Only here's the catch budget places were all taken. The commercial option cost a fabulous amount of money for Julia. The rector offered a way out. One day he called Julia to himself and offered her the only, in his opinion, suitable option. I know your situation. I wouldn't wish it on an enemy. So began the conversation a man who always reminded Julia of Carlson. Just as good-natured, full and short. Student, you are diligent and promising. Such a one wants to help. That's why I'll close the session for you, no matter what. Let us draw the lines of the movie and you take a sabbatical for a year. I'll help you get a job for family reasons, raise money for school. You'll make it. You're a man of determination. And then when you stop, I'll help you with all the details. What do you think? Julia thought about it. She didn't want to interrupt her studies. On the other hand, what other options did she have? The session is not passed, that's for sure. So, expulsion. And where to go? to go home, to her parents' apartment. So there's already a new suitor living there, 
a young and kind of nice guy, Stepan. Unlike the previous aluminum suitors, he's not a rich major. The guy works at a construction site, working from dawn to dusk, earning money. Seems to love Helen very much and has taken in all of her children. Maybe they'll actually have a family. Julia is completely unnecessary there right now. And she doesn't want to live with her sister. No, Julia loves her very much. She is the only person in the whole world who can be related to her. But still Julia is used to peace, solitude, freedom. And there's a family with many children. You can't do that there. And after all, she doesn't want to leave Orkovsky. It's a big city. It's beautiful, spacious, interesting. Here there are more prospects for work and study. The urban type settlement, where Julia spent her childhood, was associated with rage and hopeless longing. No, she didn't want to go back there at all. You know, I'll probably take advantage of your offer. Julia smiled at the rector. What a smart girl, asked the man. You're good, you'll do well. Just don't forget to save for your studies. Be sure to come back to the university in a year. We will be waiting for you. Deal? It's a deal. Thank you very much for the offer. That same night, Julia started looking for a job. She urgently needed money just to survive, to buy food, to pay for a roof over her head. The most effective motivation of all. It turned out that it was simply unrealistic to find anything close to the desired profession for a girl with an incomplete university degree. Julia was rejected everywhere. Employers did not even consider candidates without a diploma. The girl realized that she could show herself at the interview, but it did not even come to that. After a couple of days of fruitless searches, Julia realized it was time to part with the dream of working as an economist or rather, to postpone it until better times. In the meantime, it is necessary to find something. When the bar was lowered a bit, things went better. Julia found a lot of vacancies, waitress, cleaner, salesman, but the wages were meager. No, it would be enough to live on, especially if you saved money. But Julia had to save up for a year of schooling. With those salaries, it was impossible. And yet Julia needed a job. Immediately, she chose the path of a waitress and a bar in the city center. The arguments for this place were enough. First of all, there was extra pay for night shifts. Secondly, tips were very helpful, sometimes even very generous. And thirdly, the last job gave Julia the opportunity to write term papers and tests to order. And an extra penny in the piggy bank and brains are not idle. Total pluses. Work in the bar Julia even liked. The team is friendly and friendly, the bosses are loyal, the audience is decent. It was a rock bar whose owners cared about reputation. The atmosphere here was controlled. Undesirable elements were kicked out of security and never allowed in again. And another, and another. Local band musicians and performers and visiting guests gathered here every night. In general, live music. And it was beautiful. Julia listened to the musicians' performances with pleasure, singing along dancing. This in the bar was only welcomed. Going to work was like going to a holiday. In the bar, Julia finally understood the meaning of this popular phrase. Of course, with a waitress's salary, there are a lot of urgent things to do. Julia in parallel was looking for another job, more highly paid. But the girl knew even when she had to quit, she would come here to visit just to be in this amazingly warm atmosphere. The rock bar and new friends helped Julia through her grief. Of course, the longing for her mother did not go away, but the girl was finally able to come back to life and believe that there are still a lot of good things ahead. It was in a rock bar that Julia met James. One day the host introduced the guests to a new rock band, which appeared just a couple months ago. James was the bass player, but not only that, he was the one who had the idea to create this band. He was the one who wrote the songs and the music. Modest, always kept in the shadows, but continuously observing all the behavior of the band members, the reaction of the audience. James was the main man in the crew. Although on stage most of the attention was drawn to the lead singer, you could feel it. It was noticeable from the first glance. For some reason Julia immediately singled him out and reached out to him. She did not recognize herself. Julia realized that she was not in a position to fall in love and have affairs. 
She was focused on her career, on her studies, on her recovery at the university. She couldn't be distracted by all this, she couldn't be distracted. And yet, James did not study and did not flirt with waitresses, did not talk to anyone first, he was serious, focused on his work. Perhaps that was what bought the girl off. James was very much like herself. James began to appear often in the bar, sometimes with a group to work, sometimes just in the company of buddies to relax. Of course, they soon got to know each other, but he still acted kind of aloof, didn't show open sympathy. Sometimes Julia caught his eye though, but James would immediately turn away and talk to someone else. And Julia wanted him to pay attention to her, to compliment her, to give her signs of attention, as visitors often do. And then Julia would let him know that she was interested in him. One day in the company of James was a girl. This representative of the beautiful half of humanity came with him before, but they were just friends, girlfriends, other members of the group. This one was clearly something between us and James. They didn't kiss or hug, nothing like that, but sometimes they exchanged tender glances and smiled very warmly at each other. Once she laid her head right on his shoulder, and James, casual, cold, and even stern, stroked her hair in a natural and very gentle gesture, as if she were a kitten. A very unpleasant feeling was beating in Julia's chest from behind the collar. She recognized it immediately, of course, it was jealousy. With surprising scrupulousness, Julia began to pick out her rival's flaws. Too thin, not even pretty either. It's a nose, long hair, a little too liquid. Anyway, how could this madam be as good as Julia? For the first time in her life, Julia seemed to feel smug about her looks. Nature had endowed her, like Helen, with beauty. Julia had heard many compliments from others about her figure. She is tall, slender, long-legged. Her friends generally advised her to try herself in a modeling agency. Only this work was Julia was not to Julia's liking. Well, she did not know how to show herself, even somewhere that humiliating it considered it. And here, despite such impressive external data, the rival Julia was such a blue stocking. In general, there was nothing outstanding in James's companion, not even an eye to catch on. Nevertheless, he clearly had very tender feelings for her. Her presence made him happy. Julia watched James carefully and could tell that he loved his companion. It was painful, thanks to the girl that is. So to James, Julia had made up her mind, decided to do something she had previously considered unacceptable to herself. Her shift was coming to an end, but per usual she stayed late to help a waitress friend serve tables on a Saturday night. There were a lot of patrons. Julia waited for an opportune moment. She even had a little drink beforehand for courage, to feel more confident and relaxed. James stood up and headed for the exit. Someone called him. The music was blaring in the bar. It was impossible to talk on the phone in such an environment. Everyone went outside, to the porch of the bar, or to the smoking room. James chose the street. Julia followed him like a shadow, now or never. The obnoxious girl who had been sitting next to James all evening stayed at the table. She chatted merrily with his buddies. You could see that they had all known each other for a long time. Probably a long and serious relationship. And yet still Julia will try otherwise. Otherwise, she'll regret later that she didn't even try. James stepped out onto the porch. He paced the square in front of the bar, patiently explaining something to someone. Julia watched him through the large window on the door. James was not smiling, not joking. Did he see the conversation was serious or unpleasant? It didn't matter. Julia would still approach him as soon as she did. James pressed reset and was about to go back to the bar, but Julia came out to meet him. Luckily, they were alone on the porch at that moment. Hi, Julia smiled at him. James looked at her with interest. We've said hello, and I think we already have. Julia nodded at me. I need to talk to you. James immediately stopped, tuned into the conversation. All his appearance showed that he was ready to listen to his interlocutor. He could have brushed her off or shown irritation or displeasure. But James looked at her with his dark and intelligent eyes and waited. I like you, and I've liked you for a long time. Julia decided to get right to the point. I don't know how to explain it. I'm magnetically attracted to you. It's never happened to me before. 
Aya, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with all this. Julia lowered her eyes. There she'd said it. What's next? James was probably just now finding the words to stitch her down as politely as possible. He probably was. Julia suddenly felt unbearably ashamed of her action. Why had she reached out to him? How could she look him in the eye after all this? James comes to the bar a lot. And then Julia felt his hands on her shoulders. A gentle touch, as if she were some incredibly fragile vessel. Julia, the name itself, as it escaped James's lips, sounded like beautiful music to the girl. Julia, I couldn't even imagine such a thing. James looked at her and smiled. He so rarely smiled. His eyes. The girl could see it clearly. They shone with happiness. Sincere, genuine. What's going on? Is he happy for her confession? Instead of words, James kissed Julia. The girl felt dizzy from it all. He was hugging her. More precisely, even held, because the girl's legs were literally under the painting kissed. Then he stroked her back and head gently pressed her against him. I've been watching you for a long time too, and I'm attracted to you in the same way. Then why? I didn't even notice it once. I thought you didn't care. I didn't want to embarrass you. I don't. Anyway, I'm older. Older for you. I thought you were attracted to other guys, brutal, successful. With your looks, anything's possible. You're beautiful. You're unreal. You even inspired my song didn't realize I'm an Olympic princess. Is that about you? No, Julia confessed. It's a very beautiful song. I love it. I didn't even realize it came from you. Oh yeah, that's right. And that girl who came with you. Are you two together? We are. James couldn't help but chuckle. Together. Ever since my parents brought me back from the hospital with a pink bow and told me that Svetka was my sister. So she's your sister. Julia laughed out loud. I thought so. That's why I decided to have this conversation today. Sister, sister. James held Julia tighter to him and breathed in the scent of her hair, just passing through town. She's been married a long time, living far away with her husband. She misses the brotherhood of her troublemaking brother. Julia and James started dating. Turns out he's been sympathizing with the pretty waitress all this time. Why didn't he make any moves on her? I was going to. But later, when he's a little more cash flush, he had a clear attitude in his head. Girl, I'm interested in losers. So far, there was too much to do with the band, organizing performances, and so on. But the guys were already starting to earn money from their songs. The prospects were looking good. And oddly enough for a rock musician, was James shy around girls? No, he had a lot of friends with whom you can chat, laugh together. But Julia, she evoked in him a very special feeling, and that made James, used to performing in front of hundreds of people, cringe. But Julia made the first step, thus shattering all of James' doubts. And now they're together. James himself suggested moving in together. They decided to choose Julia's apartment. Convenient location, adequate cost, cozy room. So it was James who moved in with her. But he immediately took upon himself the payment of rent and minor repairs, which every dwelling needs from time to time. And it also turned out that James is an excellent cook Julia's culinary talents. Just pales in front of his skill. James, as befits a creative person, created real masterpieces. Whether in the recording studio or in the kitchen, he was gentle, sensitive, and attentive, fully immersed in his work but not forgetting about his beloved. They talked a lot, often went for walks, sometimes they discussed the next song together. It happened that Julia would suggest to her beloved the necessary phrase or words. He happily grasped the idea, and then the girl felt proud of herself. Well, how? Participated in the creation of a hit? Julia completely dissolved in her feelings and new sensations. Before meeting James, she did not know what it is love for a man. She had no time for that. First, studying hard, then trying to survive. It turned out to be so pleasant to be near a man who embraces you, interested in your mood and well-being, looks at you with admiring eyes, as at some princess, and melt from the touch of warm, strong hands. Knowing that he, this tall man with black eyes, would do anything for you, 
Helen didn't approve of her sister's choice. As always, she had her own yardstick. He's poor, he doesn't even have his own apartment. Again, no steady job, no business. He's a musician, he's got his own rock band. So what? Who needs them anyway? There's a lot of these one-day bands out there. We don't know if they'll succeed. I think you got the wrong guy. With your looks, you shouldn't do that. It's okay with me. I have three kids. Who needs me? So I'm content with what fate gives me. I don't complain. But you? Julia didn't expect her sister to understand. They were always too different. But Julia didn't need understanding. She was happy. She was loved. She had someone close to her. Yeah, he was going through a rough patch. But James tried, went to his goal, worked hard, looked for the right contacts, planned something. Julia supported him in all his endeavors, and he appreciated her devotion. Many times he said that he was grateful to fate for such a gift, for her. One day James undertook a rather risky endeavor, inviting a famous rock band to Orkowski. It was planned that his band would perform as a warm-up act for the famous musicians. This event was to increase the popularity of the band James. Well, and in general, the organization of such concerts is a way to earn good money. But something went wrong. Not as many people came to the concert as planned. There was a big rock festival in a neighboring state. James didn't take that into account. Or rather, he found out about the festival too late, when everything was already in full swing. In general, James went into a big disadvantage payment of musicians' fees, rent of the hall and equipment, tickets for the rock band, promotional activities, all this was paid off only half of the money from ticket sales. The concert itself was great, but James had huge debts that had to be closed as soon as possible. But with what? It was hard for Julia to look at her lover. During this period he looked confused, anxious. I wanted to help him at least something. But how? Where did Julia get the money from? James took out a loan, but it was just a drop in the ocean. His friends helped him, the situation improved, but the debt was still quite substantial. And then, then Julia offered to help. She had savings, money she was saving for her studies. Not much, of course, but still. In addition, the girl did what she had been against for a long time. She took out a consumer loan. These funds were quite enough to close the debt. From where? Surprised James, when Julia handed him several packs of new crispy bills. Well, just out of the blue, my debt was paid off, plus the insurance. Finally paid off the cell phone case money, the girl lied. She knew. If she told James the truth, he'd never take her money. And so it wasn't like it was the last one that came in by accident. Thank you. James hugged Julia tightly. I'll pay you back. You'll see, we'll be famous soon, and I'll pay it all back. James paid the debt and continued to develop the band. Julia slowly paid off the loan. It was no longer possible to save for school, and in general, the salary suddenly became much smaller. The bar had fallen on hard times. It was good that James bought groceries and paid the rent. That is, he took the main part of the expenses on himself. James' income came from a few corporate gigs and the occasional part-time job. Unstable earnings, but still does not dry up, and the stream is empty and then thick. Julia, not caring about the financial side of their relationship. She enjoyed James' attention, bathed in his love and care, and generously gave him tenderness, love, support. Julia tried not to think about the future, but not to recover in the university this year will do it next year. Nothing to worry about. She still had time. The most important thing is that he, James, is there for her. Julia didn't know she was capable of such feelings. And then James disappeared. No, he didn't run away from Julia. Nothing bad happened to him. It started out as a business trip. You can imagine, James grabbed Julia by the shoulder and even shook her a little. His eyes burned like two bright spotlights. You can imagine, I was invited to Germany to write music for a band. They found me on the internet, and they liked it. And now I'm invited. Julia couldn't believe her ears. She knew the band James was talking about. They were very popular musicians, touring all over the world. And they'd noticed James. They're offering him a partnership. Unbelievable. I'm going to have to go away for a while, James continued. Do you realize what that means? 
Julia nodded. She understood the money, the fame, the dizzying opportunities for James to grow and develop as a musician. Useful acquaintances and connections. James would get things he'd never dreamed of, but it looks like they're going to have to part ways indefinitely. After all, James clearly said I have to leave me, not us. The packing started. James had a lot of things to sort out. First of all, finding a replacement. Someone has to play in his band in his place. Temporarily. While he was away, of course. Secondly, James had to apply for a passport and visa. Thirdly, packing. In all the hustle and bustle, he seemed to have forgotten all about Julia. James was too enthusiastic about the upcoming changes and prospects. The girl looked at him and realized he would forget about her. Forget about her. In another country, muted by new impressions, excited by work and success. Perhaps James would even find someone there. But James, he hugged her so tenderly in the evenings, so sincerely assured her that he would miss her. Time will pass quickly. And then there's the video link. We'll be in constant contact with each other. At least I'll make some money, finally pay you back in a decent way. I know how much you need that money. Maybe we can even buy an apartment. My band will get bigger. I'll gain invaluable experience. I'll know how to do things. Everything's gonna be fine. James truly believed that. Julia saw it. He wasn't lying, he wasn't bullshitting. But something told the girl that everything would change as soon as her beloved was abroad. It's just that James himself doesn't realize it yet. That's how it turned out in the end. At first James called every day, as promised, telling her how to settle in at the new place. Everything thrilled him, the experience overwhelmed him. And then he suddenly dropped off the radar. He just disappeared. He didn't call or answer Julia's calls. Long rings steadily ended with the message that the subscriber, apparently busy and therefore cannot answer. Julia was alarmed at first. I thought that something had happened to him something terrible, irreparable. But soon she saw a fresh performance of that band on the music channel. James was with them. He was very different, mature, and even more serious than usual. I mean, there was nothing wrong with him. It's just that he'd apparently decided to start a new life and cut off all his old ties, including forgetting about her. And Julia? At first, the girl still hoped, waited for him to call, to explain everything. But James disappeared completely out of her life. Julia made it a habit to watch the music channel every day. Every once in a while, she'd see James. He was never the center of attention, but he still got in the camera lens sometimes. And quite often the girl next to him was the same girl, either a makeup artist or the band's costumer. Beautiful, bright. Apparently, there was something between her and James. Julia was desperately jealous of James, both of this girl and of her lover's other potential husbands. She was hurt, hurt like she had never been hurt before, and also hurt and scared. Scared of being alone again without the support and warmth of a loved one. An unpleasant mixture of feelings and emotions. And there were other problems, more pressing. Moneylessness. Julia could barely make ends meet. She had a tiny salary and a loan. Eventually the bar went bankrupt. The new owners bought it and set up Julia's Coca Lounge. She had to quit, like all the other employees. Another blow. Julia had special memories and feelings connected with this place. And now there was no cozy bar where you could always enjoy live music, where there was a friendly, warm atmosphere. James would understand, support her. Everything was easier and more pleasant with him in general. But he was hundreds of kilometers away from her and seemed to have forgotten all about her. James had no idea how desperate she was. He never found out about the loan. He thought Julia had helped him with the extra money she'd suddenly received. And of course, he has no idea she's been fired. And if he did, what would he care about her now? Julia had no time to go over the offenses and think about how it would be if she desperately needed a job, and preferably in a decently paid, and so the girl tirelessly scored the ads. Wanted to find something that would help to get out of the financial hole. Well, at least the landlord agreed to wait with payment. But he's got a lot of patience too. Julia will be asked to leave. This ad caught Julia's attention with the amount of money that was offered for the services. Not a bad figure. It could solve many of the girl's problems. 
But the job, the job itself seemed too unfamiliar to Julia. A nurse was needed for a little girl. The sort of unhealthy diagnosis didn't agree, but the person who gave the ad made it clear the child needed round-the-clock supervision and care, including taking medication by the hour, accompanying her to procedures, and so on. Julia wondered. She had experience in caring for babies. Thanks, Helen, her conclusion. The girl even enjoyed fiddling with her nephews. She knew how to get along with small children, knew how to feed them, change their clothes, keep them occupied. But here we were talking about a sick child, a seriously ill one by the looks of it. Could she do it? At least it was worth a try. Julia called the given number. She was answered by a pleasant male voice. The man asked her several questions. Age, occupation, education, experience with small children.